Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and welcome everyone to our live event, our Ramadan 1445 event on this blessed 21st day of Ramadan. We are so grateful to have you all joining us today. Um, I will start with Rabbish Rahli Sadri wa Yasirli Amri Wahlul Uqdatam Millasani Yafahu Qawli. Um, we praise Allah and ask Allah to send his blessings onto our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is really an honor to be here with you all. Um, my name is Shaza Khan and I am the Executive Director of the Islamic Schools League of America. Um, your host for this, for this afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you're joining from, mashallah. If you have a minute, please, um, and you haven't already done so, please do go ahead and um, introduce yourself in the chat. It's always nice to know where people are calling in from, what your name is, what your role is with Islamic schools. Feel free to share as much as you'd like about yourself in that chat. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, Sister Aziza, is Brother Ibrahim with us now? Yes. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Ibrahim. Wa alaikum as -salam. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Ibrahim, are you on camera? Are you able to join? Oh, yeah. there you are. Okay, great, mashallah. If I add a pin, let's see this. Does that make you at the top of the screen? There we go. For the Ibrahim Mustafa is a seventh grader at Isla Academy. Um, Isla Academy is an Isla member school in California. And we're so grateful to have you on, Ibrahim, to start us off with a Quranic recitation. Jazakallah khair for joining us. All right. Okay. Um... You can start, Ibrahim. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Ayyamu rabbayuna kabirun fama wahanu lima asbahum fi sabilillahi wa ma da'ufu wa ma stakanu wallahu yuhibbu sabirin. وما كان قولهم إلا أن قالوا ربنا ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وبب ونبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين فأتيهم الله Thank you so much, Ibrahim. Your voice cut off just a little bit in between, but alhamdulillah, we have the text right here. Ibrahim, would you like to read the translation for us? Okay. Imagine how many devote, devotees devotees fought along the, with their parents and never faltered despite whatever losses. They suffered in the cause of Allah, nor did they weaken or give in. Allah... Allah loves those who preserve, 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 persevere, persevere, and forgive our sins and excesses, make our stern steps firm, and grant us victory over the disbelieving people. So Allah gave them the reward of the, this world and the excellent reward of the hereafter, for Allah loves the good doers. Thank you so much. And we've got one more ayah. Okay. Ya ayyuhalladina amanu kunu kawwa minna bil kasti suhada alillahi walau ala anfusikum aw aw wal walidaini aw al walidaini wal akri akrabina in يكون غنيا أو فاكرا فأولى فعل الله عولانا بهما فلا تتبعوا And what's the translation for the Ibrahim? 
O believers, stand firm for just as witness for Allah, even if it is against yourselves, your parents, or close relatives. Be they rich or poor, Allah is best to ensure their interests. So do not let your desires cause you to deviate from justice. If you distort the testimony or refuse to give it, to give it, then know that Allah is certainly all aware of what you do. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. It's very courageous of you to come on and join our um, our webinar and to recite for us. I really appreciate you doing that. May Allah make the Quran the light in your heart and the light around you and the light of your life and make you a light for everyone around you. You've just brought us so much light. Jazakallah khair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So uh, just to introduce myself, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, my name is Shaza Khan, and I am the executive director of the Islamic Schools League of America. It is really an honor for me to uh, be here with you all in this capacity, alhamdulillah. I've been serving the ISLA for seven years now, alhamdulillah. I can't believe how time flies. Um, Sister Karen Keyworth, um, the late Sister Karen Keyworth, may Allah be pleased with her, and Sister Judy Amri and many others. Um, some of those of you who are still with us here, alhamdulillah, established this organization over 25 years ago. I myself come into this um, space as a researcher by training, as well as an educator, a teacher. Uh, I taught middle school, so I love it. Anyone who's taught middle school knows that there's a certain personality, right, about middle school teachers, alhamdulillah. And I'm so grateful to have that. And, and I found um, teaching those children such a joy, alhamdulillah. And likewise, leading the ISLA, um, you know, being able to be in this space where we are able to connect and network 300 plus full-time Islamic schools around the United States. And increasingly through our partnerships, um, those across the uh, continental uh, divides across the world, mashallah, we're really honored. Um, in the United States alone, we estimate there's about 60,000 um, students attending our full-time Islamic schools and very likely a higher number as well. Um, in terms of ISLA's reach, we know that there are many weekend Islamic school educators as well as homeschoolers who also tap into our network and resources. So we know that our reach, alhamdulillah, is actually well beyond this, inshallah. In terms of the work that we do, we connect directly with our Islamic school educators. Many of you here, um, in fact, have that capacity. If you haven't already done so, please do introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us where you're calling in from, what role you play, how you're connected to Islamic schools. Um, we have over 5,000 educational professionals that we communicate with and um, share our research resources and relationships with. Some of the research that we've engaged in um, includes just trying to understand the impact of COVID-19 on Islamic schools to be able to tell our story. We want to tell our story. We want, and through your help and your engagement, your responses to our um, research studies, our pulse surveys, we've been able to do that. We've published um, internal reports that are available on our website. Sister Khansa will be dropping a number of links here in the chat as I speak. And throughout this entire um, weekend, I'll introduce Khansa to you in just a bit. Um, but check those out, inshallah. Open the tab and save it and then come back to this Zoom screen so that you can fully engage. Um, we've also published and um, just recently had a book chapter published in um, a book, an edited volume on COVID-19 and Muslims, alhamdulillah. We have published this fabulous um, asset, this report on the profile of Islamic school principles in the United States. We have published on alumni and what they have to say about our Islamic schools. We believe that we need to be research informed to and elevate our Islamic schools. And so that is where you see some of this work coming in. Through this research, we like to have that inform the resources that we provide for you all. Um, we've recently created and, and launched an interactive uh, school directory on our map. This is a new and improved version for those of you who've been with us for um, over the decades, alhamdulillah. We've had an interactive map, but this one is absolutely phenomenal. SubhanAllah, it has a number of, um, a lot of information you can find about Islamic schools, and it's meant to be a support for educators, for those looking for other jobs, for parents, um, for researchers. We do job opportunities. We do um, student-facing events. Um, this uh, screenshot of the Mansa Musa with partnership with Muslim Kids TV, alhamdulillah, we're able to create animated shorts about um, phenomenal African and African-American Muslims from around the world and over time. Uh, alhamdulillah, we provide professional development, We've created a crisis management toolkit to help Islamic schools um, prevent, respond to, and um, inshallah communicate 
if ever, God forbid, there is a crisis in our schools. And we do all of this not by ourselves, but alhamdulillah, in relation, by building relationships with other phenomenal organizations, big and small. This is just the splatter of some of the organizations that we have been engaging with just in the past year, subhanAllah. So alhamdulillah, the work that we do, we know we can't do it alone. What's not represented here is the relationships that we try to build with each of you, alhamdulillah. So again, it's not in vain that we ask you to introduce yourself, um, you know, or to reach out to us and to email us. We genuinely feel that we are enriched by our communication and our connection with you. So jazakallah khair for those of you who take the time and effort to do so. And alhamdulillah, behind this phenomenal organization are these amazing um, global leaders and thinkers in Islamic education, founders of Islamic schools here in the United States and leaders of Islamic schools across the world, subhanAllah, teacher educators in universities. I can't go through and introduce them all to you, but here's just um, you know a, a visual for you of the phenomenal team, the thought leadership behind this organization. We're so grateful to each and every one of them. Thank you so much to the ISLA board. And here we are, a small and mighty staff, alhamdulillah, inshallah, by Allah's will and by your support. I'm the executive director, Dr. Samar Majede is going to be speaking soon. Um, she's the re research project manager on a few key um, projects that we've done and will continue to do. And Sayyidah Khansa Batul is here with us too. She's the executive assistant, phenomenal and talented um, graphic designer and communications um, director. And the Masjid Solutions um, team that supports us on our website development, alhamdulillah. Well, that was just a little introduction so that those of you who have joined us for the first time and may not know about ISLA have a better idea of who we are. Um, at this time, I'd really like us to be able to get into this topic. You have all taken out this time from your busy days and schedules or nights, wherever you're joining from, to learn more about this topic, to walk away educated, inspired, and empowered. And inshallah, we ask Allah to allow us to benefit from that. I'd like to ask us all to just take a moment. There's 75 of us here. Maybe we joined on just out of automation or out of a sense of obligation. Let's take 30 seconds to purify and elevate our intention for why we're here. No doubt one of the reasons that many of us are moved to create the time to be here today right now is because of what we are witnessing happening in Palestine. And it's hard to talk about it without getting emotional. Um, we are witnessing a genocide occurring in real time, funded by many of our governments and um, supported in many ways, insidious ways even, in fact, that we'll learn a little bit more about. And that's the part about educating ourselves um, right now. And inshallah, what else we'd like to do, you know, there's two meanings to this theme that we created from Palestine to America. It's almost as if we've received so many gifts from Palestine to us in America, majority of us here in America, um, not the least of which are a sense of um, greater connection to our ummah and identity, our identity as Muslims. And something that has just been so poignantly and painfully clear from the, from, from the brothers, our brothers and sisters in Palestine that we have witnessed um, through the numerous videos that we've seen is their perseverance. May Allah reward them and allow them to enter into the gates of Jannah that are established for those who are amongst those who are the most patient. And we're all trying to implement these lessons in our lives. And we're trying to see what we can do to serve as a solution, inshallah, in addition to our du'as, in addition to our donations. We're all trying to do something more. So alhamdulillah, here at the Issa, we also feel this amana, and I know that you all feel it too, and we're so grateful to be here together in community as an ummah. But there's another meaning to this theme from Palestine to America. And it's the theme of the struggles of our brothers and sisters who have, have engaged and who have faced oppression here in the United States. And what can we learn from them, in particular, our African-American Muslim brothers and sisters? 
Um, we're going to have two speakers speaking about this today. And we want this connection to be really clear, inshallah, that the oppression that we see right now, that we're seeing the genocide that we're seeing in Palestine um, is absolutely tragic. It does have a unique component from a religious standpoint. And there is something that there are many oppressions, many sources and forces of oppression, many of which are interconnected with what we see happening in Palestine that have happened here and continue to happen here in the United States. And it would behoove us to be part of the same systems that continue to create that oppression and marginalization that we are so pained by right now in this moment. So we invite you to um, journey with us through these conversations from Palestine to America to gain from these lessons, inshallah. You know, I'm a teacher, so we have goals. Um, anytime that we create um, a, an event or an activity or some engagement for our um, beloved community. So for today, we'd like for you to, inshallah, gain awareness. I, I believe that every single one of you will learn something new from this webinar to understand the complexity and the breadth of this problem. And surely we can't cover it all, but at least we can cover many key pieces. Um, to learn from our history, inshallah, about the ways in which we can create change through education, inshallah, and to support a solution. Yes, it is Ramadan, and we would like to encourage you and invite you to be part of the solution that we are proposing through the Teaching Palestine Toolkit. You'll hear more about this from Sister Samar al Majede, but very briefly, this is a toolkit that we will be building, inshallah, with your support and engagement, financial support, your time support and engagement, inshallah, through data informed needs assessment, it will have lesson plans, videos, recommended literature and teacher training for teachers K through 12, focusing primarily on teachers in Islamic schools. But inshallah, we foresee this a toolkit being a benefit to people um, young and old and all over the world, inshallah. We are seeking to raise $50,000, inshallah. And you see here a brief, um, Overview of the budget, we invite any of you who are interested in learning more, who are interested in giving a gift, a larger gift from a trust or um, other, other way, and you're interested in finding out more about this, please reach out to us so that we can provide you a breakdown of this, inshallah. We know that many people are joined here today, though, to learn and hear from our speakers. And so we want to introduce now just a glimpse of the amazing speakers joining us today. And um, at this point, Point, inshallah, I would like to see if um, Imam Tam Fakini is on with us. I'm not able to follow all of these. Um, I think we're actually a little bit ahead. So he might not be here yet. So inshallah, what we'll do then is um, we will go ahead and let me see who's here. Sister Bahia is joining us, alhamdulillah. And um, I'm going to go ahead and let Sister Bahia speak, inshallah, after that, uh, Imam Tam will be here. It's a very rare occasion for me to actually speak under my time limit, <laughs> but we will go with this, alhamdulillah. Sister Bahia Amawi is a speech pathologist and maybe <laughs> an activist, not by choice, but just by um, life circumstances. Sister Bahia was born in Palestine, um, and her and her family faced many obstacles in obtaining an education just in elementary school in their hometown in the West Bank. Bahia shared with us a story of having to even take a ladder to climb over the obstacles placed by the occupation forces to be able to attend school. Schools were not um, able to be in, in seize and function all throughout the year as they needed to be. And when they were, children weren't able to attend. So facing all of these obstacles, her parents made the very difficult decision of moving to the United States so that their children could gain a better education. SubhanAllah, Sister Bahia found herself in schools again and um, as a speech pathologist this time here in Texas. Um, I'm, I'm also originally from the same city as uh, Bahia is now in as well. And um, she sued the state of Texas, SubhanAllah, and won. Um, with the support of CARE and others to when she refused to sign an anti-BDS clause in her contract. It's part of all of the contracts in Texas and many other states that they are not allowed to work for, they must sign on to 
agree to not engage in boycott and divestment sanctions movements against Israel if they're going to work as an employee of the state, which would have been her position as a speech pathologist for the school. Her case has been featured in the award-winning film, Boycott. And Sister Bahia has some really phenomenal um, insights to share about what is happening in our schools and textbooks. Sister Bahia, given the little bit of extra time we have, you could um, go a little bit beyond your 10 minutes if you'd like. Thank you so much for joining us, Sister Bahia. Oh, thank you so much, you guys, for having me. Can everybody hear me well? Yes. Let me just get situated. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, everybody, and Ramadan Mubarak, and inshallah, soon to be Eid Mubarak, inshallah, bi um, I thank Jazakumullah khair for receiving me. I'm really happy and excited to be joining with other individuals who equally value education as much as I do. As um, Shaz explained, spending my early childhood in Palestine, education was hard to come by. It was kind of uh, scarce due to the occupation, uh, school closures, and um, bismillah, um, curfews that lasted for weeks was a, a common thing. Um, so my, we did immigrate in the 1980s to the United States for the sole purpose of getting educated. So my parents sacrificed a lot for us to sacrifice time with their parents, their family, and living in their hometown. Um, as we all know, education is freedom. <clears throat> it is a way out of oppression, out of poverty. It is something no one can take away from you. And most importantly, it is power. And subhanAllah, education uh, is so important that the first verse in the Quran revealed was not pray, but ikra. Because when we read and learn and educate ourselves, everything else makes sense, becomes easy to follow. And Allah mentions Iqra twice in the Quran, once to learn about the deen, the religion, and the second one to learn about worldly matters. In addition to that, he also mentions the pen. So the pen here has a lot of relevance because subhanAllah, when we write things down, that's how we acquire knowledge. And I think that's really profound. Unfortunately, in regards to the history of Palestine, the Muslims in America, we never wrote anything down. We never created any core content, any strong content. Um, therefore, the Muslims' knowledge, uh, especially the youth, is kind of bleak and almost absent. Not only um, are the Muslims' knowledge lacking, but because we didn't create any content, we also lost out on the power. And instead, the Zionists gained this power. They gained the power by having, by controlling the narrative and by having their narrative adopted in public schools. They gained the power by having their perspective to be the only one that's understood to agree where, where laws, where laws were made just to adjust to them and attack us. Where people, um, you know, mentality of people uh, thinking was changed as well to the point where uh, people are made to believe that the oppressors are actually the victims and the ones oppressed are actually the aggressors, which is, is um, unbelievable. But this is what's happening. And that's how powerful curriculum is when it is taught, subhanAllah. And unfortunately, they taught it in a, in a wrong way and used it as a propaganda. And that's why we have to regain that power, inshallah, bi that. So in the next few slides, I'm going to share with you guys some things I, uh, I learned um, about the curriculum that's been used in the public schools for years now. We're going to talk about the main source that's been utilized in the public schools called Institute for Curriculum Services. We're going to use it to talk about their tactics and the uses and why do Muslim schools um, need uh, to vet to vet resources on Palestine at this time. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So let me give you some background on how I came across ICS and how I learned about ICS. <clears throat> So um, a few years back after my lawsuit was complete, and alhamdulillah, we won the lawsuit, by the way, and I was back at work, um, alhamdulillah, with the mercy of Allah, um, I was part of a, a, a curriculum um, group uh, with uh, an organization called Texas Coalition for Human Rights and uh, CARE Texas in order for us to um, testify in front of the Texas Education Board during their social studies review, which happens every four years. So we were planning for it and we have had testimonies ready. And subhanAllah, as um, we were about to testify the day before that we were notified that the whole um, review was canceled for social studies only and they never rescheduled it. 
But during that year, we were in touch with a sister chapter of Texas Coalition for Human Rights called Virginia Coalition for Human Rights. And they, that same year, had just um, you know, uh, found ICS and learned about ICS because two of their members happened to be teachers. And so they saw the training for the ICS through their school district and they went and attended and they found how egregious the material was and how discriminatory it was. So the Virginia Coalition for Human Rights um, decided to, you know, take on this task and challenge the, the curriculum at the Virginia Education Board. And alhamdulillah, they were successful, actually, in eliminating ICS entirely from their state, which is amazing. So this is the things that I'm going to share with you from Virginia Coalition from Human Rights. Uh, I'm going to give all the credits to them. Uh, kudos for them for doing all this work and effort and helping us learn more on how to um, tackle this challenge. So ICS, Institute for Curriculum Services, is a nonprofit organization. It is camouflaged to be an edu education outlet, but it's not. It's a public affairs and advocacy group. It is dedicated to improving the quality of K-12 education on Jews, Judaism, and Israel. It is operated and funded by the Jewish Community Relations Council of San Francisco Bay Area and funded by Israeli Zionist groups. They're really, they're, the funding is, out, is enormous and all of them are written in Israel. And so um, these are hired help, these hired individuals that run ICS um, and they have enough money to, to, um, to provide a curriculum for the whole entire state. And you will see how uh, vast it is and how much that is involved. Um, and they don't only write curriculum for the state uh, education boards, but they also do edits for social studies textbooks that we're normally accustomed to, which is like Hartcourt and Pearson and McGraw-Hill. These are textbooks I'm sure you guys are all familiar with and all Islamic schools probably also have. Um, and in addition to that, they make it very um, appealing to ISDs to um, attend these trainings, have the teachers attend the trainings, because they provide free training for teachers. They provide food for them, swags, and even hours for um, education, for continuing education. So this is the, the funding I was telling you about. They're heavily, heavily funded by huge Israeli organizations and Jewish and Zionist organizations. Um, one of them is the Schusterman Fa Family Foundation, which is, uh, which is responsible for paying the freshman politicians uh, a, a paid trip to Israel every time uh, when they first get elected. That's how rooted they are in the state of Israel. And this is just a few of the organizations that support it. So th that to them is, makes them very strong because they they can continue and have resources as much as they want to. They can spend as much as they want to because funding is not an issue for them. All right, this is uh, um, the, the students and teachers they have reached so far. So I'm going to guys have you look at that, give you a few seconds so you can kind of, um, you know, uh, ponder about that and see how much impact they've had in the United States. And it's, it's quite uh, intense. It's really kind of scary uh, the much in involvement they've had and impact they've had. And pay attention to the number of students that have been impacted and, and uh, have been directly affected by the content of ICS, 11 million, which is amazing. It's outrageous, really outrageous. All right, examples of the curriculum that they teach and train, give, give, uh, provide teacher training and the content, um, as well as the edits, example of the edits they stress in the textbooks that I mentioned that we're all accustomed to. So the teacher training and, and uh, um, the material they write about is the Arab-Israeli conflict, environmental challenges and cooperation, um, religions and politics. And this is the edits they stress, heavily stress in all the textbooks. And they have been very successful, unfortunately. Um, they use sanitized language that, that for settlers becomes communities, right? <laughs> Oahu becomes security fence. And they always blame the Arabs for everything. Arab culpability is all over, like left and right, from the every war, every crisis, even the uh, the you know the, uh, the the failure of the peace uh, treaties. Everything is uh, Palest Arab and Palestinian culp culpability, and never Israeli. And they discourage students. ICS heavily discourages students and and trains the, the teachers not to have the students use open internet, which again. It's just with this, with it, this, the, the generation that we're in, this is just outrageous. Um, and they change actually the maps. They change the maps to, to meet their needs. And you guys will see that more in detail. Um, and Bismillah, they delete the reference to Palestine entirely. Here's an example of them taking out the word occupied territories. 
That's just an example of some, this is textbook edit. Um, occupied territories and making it, they're saying it's politicized term. Instead, just use the word West Bank and Gaza. But the thing is, the problem with that is you take out that word, there's no way students going to critically think there's an occupation happening. You know, and so that's that's problematic. The words they take out is what's needed to be placed in there, what is needed in order for kids to understand really what's happening on the ground. So Virginia Coalition for Human Rights, this is what they provided for the Virginia Education Board. This is what they submitted after they spoke, because you only allowed a lot of a small amount of time to speak, so they couldn't really cover all of that, but this is what they submitted um, when they spoke. So I want you guys to look at all the different columns. We have the themes of the IC edits, examples of the edits, and the problems that with their edits. And again, kudos to Virginia Coalition for Human Rights for providing this. Um, it's really gave us a lot of input and make it understand how to tackle things here. Um, so look at the first box, we're referencing Palestine. Again, uh, they are take out the word Palestine. You can use mandatory Palestine or um, use uh, Palestinians instead, but never the word Palestine. And the reason is they have that in the middle. The reasoning behind that is there's no state of Palestine, nor has there ever been one. That's what they're trying to educate the teachers. This is what they teach the teachers, by the way. That's the training for the teachers. The teachers have, they change the mentality of the teachers. So, oh, there was never, I didn't know that. There was no never a Palestine state, but that of course is false because we know that Palestine has been referred to as, as that name Palestine has been referred to for a long time, for decades and, and, and generations. And then over um, 136 members of the UN recognize the state of Palestine. Um, here, the second box uh, on, under themes, you have the culpability of uh, the, the Arab culpability for everything, every failure, peace treaties, everything possible, the every war with the, Pal the Arabs and the Palestinian culpability, never Israeli fault. And look at uh, what I circled in there. It says never Israeli culpability, even when it is undisputed historic fact. So again, this is what they're trying to push. And they do push it, by the way. Um, the 67 war in the middle, what I circle, 67 war is one of the most misconstrued um, war ever. That's the six day war, it's referred to as a six day war. And it's the most misunderstood war and they always blame it on Arabs and Egyptians have attacked first when it's absolutely false. That is, it's like, mis it's not even misleading but it's misfactual entirely. Um, and you will see, um, you guys, some of the uh, problems with the edits and I will, I can't, I won't have enough time to read all of that. So I please, um, I will leave this the, the page open a little bit so you guys can go over it yourself. <clears throat> um, the third box below is talks about, again, the terminology, take out settlers and occupation wall, replace them with communities, control, security fences, and refer to militants as terrorists. <clears throat> um, yeah. And here in the middle, again, they're replacing the phrase occupied territories with captured areas instead, um, instead of occupied. But again, these are terms that will uh, unfortunately take away the critical thinking for students to understand really what's happening and that there's an occupation occurring. And they never refer to anything from the UN. And the UN information is so crucial because it shows the illegality behind everything Israel is doing um, and the, um, the international laws, which are never referenced, by the way, in textbooks at all or in, um, in education, um, in state education boards, which I think are valuable in using those resources um, to, just to explain and justify how the Israelis is in the wrong. Because I, like Amnesty International and UN, we need to use those materials to justify what is happening and make people understand uh, that they are in the wrong. Okay. Maybe a few seconds. All right, this is another page again. Uh, it's a, it's a countless number of pages, but I'm just sharing a couple of them with you guys because we don't, for time uh, purposes. But here, and in, in this... Um, this theme over here, the first one, they're referencing that they're saying don't don't refer to Jerusalem as being occupied East Jerusalem, but have it Israeli and next East Jerusalem, um, and and they allowed uh, in the middle they tell you don't say that the Jewish that there was Jewish occupied uh, occupied territories or there is Israeli settlers, but instead refer to Israeli Jewish settlers as um, people who are allowed to to build homes, allowed building of homes and communities in, in the same areas which Palestinians again. Opposed. So put again, put the blame on Palestinians. You know, Palestinian opposed having Jewish people live in and build communities in um, um, in East Jerusalem. When actually, in fact, of course, we know that demolishing 
um, Palestinian homes and erasing Palestinian lands and replacing them with Jewish settlers, as we know in Silwan and um, Hawar and, um, and all these um, other um, areas in East Jerusalem. And then, of course, the UN referenced that it's illegal to do that. And, and that's really crucial, again, for kids to understand. Um, the, the, one on, the second one in the middle one, on the, the under themes, you have the content about regarding claims to occupy territories. This is when they actually changed the map. So instead of saying Golan Heights was occupied, they said they entirely changed the map and said Golan Heights belongs to Israel rather than Syria. This is the extent they went to, and they were able to succeed with it. No one, you know, um, interfered. No one objected, because again, most of this, most teachers don't understand this material. They never learned this much stuff, so it is something foreign to them. So they just take it by word of mouth, and they just believe what the ICS is saying because they believe it's a curriculum service, it's a curriculum organization. So they think it's, you know, valid and. Uh, and there is, it's fact checked and all this stuff. And unfortunately, schools don't take that time to validate everything. And, and that's really problematic. Um, the last one I'm going to share with you on the bottom in the middle. Again, this is the referencing to um, uh, making sure the students are don't use open Internet. And instead, they direct them to specific Internet um, sites, websites like the ADL which we know is a Zionist organization. They say that in their charter. How do we know that? They say in their charter, any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. And anytime you have that, where they use anti-Semitism to protect Israel, you know that is a Zionist because anti-Semitism is not meant to protect Israel. It's meant to, to, um, to protect Jewish people because anti-Semitism is real. It does happen. And ironically, it does not happen or portrayed by Arabs or Muslims. It is by done by Western um, people in Europe here in America equally. And also they have the Jewish virtual library. So this is what they refer kids to um, reference. So of course, what they're going to learn, the same propaganda, the, mis the same misleading information. Maybe and you guys three minutes just again. Just a couple minutes left, Sister Bahia. Okay, Shama. All right, so this is uh, just, again, this is something my daughter's textbook had in sixth grade. Um, and so um, you guys can look at it, but again, they're blaming the Arabs for rejecting the 1948 partition, but explaining um, but behind the, the, the unfair uh, splitting of the, the, the splitting of the states. And I want you to pay attention to the glossary terms they used intifada as a violent resistance and instead of, uh, and when actually intifada was a nonviolent resistance, it began as a nonviolent resistance. Israeli settlement is a place in the West Bank or Gaza where Israelis have settled. So this is how they sanitize the term Israeli settlement. They just place it as a place where they have settled. Here are the images they, they use in the schools and public schools and, and textbooks and state um, curriculum. So they, 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 um, they view the Israelis as just kind of in, in defending themselves and they're just standing kind of just on the lookout and they're mourning their dead as Palestinians and Muslims. What are they doing? They're violent, they're praying with their weapons. And um, lastly, you guys, this is why Muslim schools need well-researched and vetted resources on Palestine at this time. If your school is using the accustomed textbooks that we have mentioned, Pearson, Hartcore, McGraw Hill, these and and and, and um, state um, education board material, then your kids are being directly impacted by the ICS information, which is misleading, it's selective framing, it's missing content, and, and that is problematic. That means our kids, our Muslim kids, are not learning the facts. They are not understanding what is happening, and this is injustice and disservice to all the students because they're not, uh, they're gonna be narrow-minded students instead of critical thinkers. This curriculum would deprive our students of skills needed to become true future Muslim leaders. Not Muslim leaders in their jobs, but Muslim leaders in their communities and advocating for the rights Muslim rights and being involved in activism. We don't know which path, um, what, how the Muslims will be received after what happens in Palestine, depending on what happens in Palestine, and what, depending on what happens with Trump. We don't know what's how we're going to be received here, what laws will be made against us. So our kids have to be ready for those challenges. We initiate a lot of things for our kids, but now they have to carry it over because that challenge is not over yet.
What is taught is in the schools and lower grades and high school has to be transformational. It has to affect, change the character of our students and our mind thinking of the students. They have to be engaged and have to be articulate and skilled and ready to take on these challenges that are ahead of them as they grow up. And, and things that come to, to, toward them. Um, otherwise, if, if, if they are exposed to negative images and they don't know anything better, then it's gonna lead to self-doubt and lack of confidence and they will withdraw or just um, distance themselves from anything has to do with Islam or Palestine. And that becomes, of course, problematic. And finally, Islamic schools have a responsibility. They have they play a pivotal role in, in helping foster Islamic education in this country. So it's, it's not just isolated to the, the, um, the school itself and to the students, but their, their role is important for the whole community. The community should probably looks up to them and trust them that they will have these materials ready for them. And my opinion, school, Islamic schools should have um, ready materials on certain essential topics like Islam as a religion in general, Ramadan, 9-11, and of course, Palestine, and we can add many more things to it. I know their, uh, their time is limited and their resources as far as teacher availability is limited and uh, funding is limited, but this is where ISLA is, can be beneficial and can fill in that gap. If, if the, you know, I believe that, if, if, for instance, if the, the annual fundraising for the schools, the Islamic schools can have an area for fundraising for Islam, explain the importance of ISLA and having them filling that gap to have ready-made ready -made material for schools to pass out to public schools to share with them. Uh, many times you have uh, parents from public schools who come and when uh, are trying to find material, ready-made material, like toolkits for Ramadan, but there's nothing really concrete available. And this is true regarding Palestine as well. So really, this is a, an opportunity for Islamic schools to fill in that gap and help expand the education about Islam. And for me, in my opinion, as Muslims in America, our purpose is here is da'wah and education. And this is an opportunity for that. Thank you so much, Sister Bahia. Jazakum al khairan for really insightful and informative um, information here about what our Islamic schools are inadvertently teaching um, when we are not engaging in criticality as our uh, sister, Dr. Goldie is going to be talking about. Uh, but Alhamdulillah, we have an opportunity and we look forward to hearing more. At this point, I would like to invite our dear brother, Imam um, Tom Fakini. Inshallah, I will share my screen um, or not. Imam Tom is here with us. Thank you so much, Imam Tom, for joining us. Imam Tam is, um, has a BA in political science from Basar College in 2011 and studied at the Islamic University of Medina in 2015 through 2020, where he obtained his BA from the Faculty of Sharia. Imam Tam is currently the Research Director of Islam and Society at Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research. He's also a resident scholar of Utica Masjid and um, the Imam of Hamilton College, where he does chaplaincy work. In addition, Imam Tom also teaches tafsir to middle schoolers online through Legacy International Online High School, one of our uh, beloved schools, mashallah, Imam Tom. We're so delighted to have you here with us. Thank you so much for joining us. This one, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor, and it's an honor to speak in front of you all today. It was an honor to receive the invitation. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam, ala ashraf al-anbiya wa mursaleen, nabina wa qudwatina Muhammad alayhi afla wa salam, wa askan taslim. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'na wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna alman, ya rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum to everybody. Um, wonderful, wonderful uh, event here with a very, very important initiative. So I'll get right to it. Um, the issue, Qadiyya to Philistine, the issue of Palestine is the closest thing we have both in our ummah and outside of our ummah to a litmus test, to a true furqan, something that clearly delineates whose heart is calibrated correctly and whose heart has disease in it that needs to be remedied. When it comes to outside of our communities, outside of the Muslim community, it is a litmus test of your humanity. If you cannot find it in yourself to have solidarity with Palestine, then there is something wrong with your heart. Maybe you have been indoctrinated according to the ICS curriculum or something else, or the many other sort of initiatives that are out there in order to conceal the truth from you. If you are in our ummah and you do not, your heart does not bleed for Palestine, then there is disease in your heart. And unfortunately, unfortunately, one of the 
things that we have seen in the past five months has been that we do have pockets of our ummah, both here in the United States and elsewhere, where concern for Palestine is not where it should be, and feeling for Palestine is not where it should be. That this has been a fitna, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the literal sense of the word, has shown us ourselves through a mirror, held up a mirror to ourselves and showed us, were we prioritizing acceptance into the structures of power that currently exist? Were we prioritizing our ethnic identity? Or were we prioritizing our umatic identity, the identity of relating to our brothers and sisters uh, in Philistine, when they bleed, we bleed. The mirror has been held up. And so in addition to being a mirror and a litmus test, Philistine, Palestine is also the one true rallying point that we have as Muslims. It is the one issue that there should be no ambiguity about, that everybody should be on the same page about, and that we should be able to use as a fulcrum, as a pivotal moment in Islamic history and in world history, that we rally behind this particular, uh, this particular issue in order to uh, deliver justice and move forward and redeem a lot of the forces that have that are responsible. When it comes to the Muslims of America in particular, we have, I believe personally, a unique and perhaps the most responsibility of any Muslims on the face of this planet. Because if you live in the United States and you pay taxes in the United States, it is your money that is going towards every single bullet every single bomb, every single missile, every single person who is, uh, every single settlement, every single political cover or opportunity of political cover that is given for everything that has happened to occur, it starts in the United States. And if it were not for the United States, then none of what was happening and what has happened and what is happening for the last five months would be possible. That I believe is indisputable fact. So if you are a Muslim in the United States, you have a unique responsibility. You are perhaps the most responsible. And there are many fronts in this battle uh, when it comes to acting in according to our ability to respond, being truly responsible. As Sister Bahia just showed us that the curriculum front is one of the most important fronts. The narrative front, the media front is one of the most important fronts. As Malcolm X, Rahim Hullah used to say, only a fool would allow his enemy to educate his children. And we see what the tangible results of that are. That the, really, literally, what Sister Bahia was illustrating, self-hate, right? Um, doubt in our own faith, right? These are things that if we allow the, a vacuum to exist when it comes to the narrative of what is going on and what we stand for and what is true and what is just, then we will soon, unfortunately, Allah, lose our own children. Uh, in this process, if we don't stand up and start to react. Islamic schools are on the forefront of this battle. And everybody here, you know, understands the important issue of curriculum and the need to develop curriculum. Honestly, it's a little bit embarrassing. When Sister Bahia was showing her uh, her presentation, it was embarrassing that the the organization that was responsible for pointing out the mistakes in the ICS was not a Muslim organization. This is culpability in front of Allah on the day of judgment. And we have to really reckon with ourselves here. What are we doing with our time, with our resources, with our energy that we have to rely on non-Muslims to correct the textbooks that our Muslim children are being taught? Wallahi aib. If you speak Arabic, you know that this is a shame. And it is, I like to say, that today is day one of the next 20 years. That the previous 20 years, we can understand and we can put it in a post-9-11 sort of mindset and uh, context. And we can say that maybe after 9-11, we were scared as a community and we pivoted to this and we pivoted to relief work and we pivoted to safe things that we thought perhaps that we would gain acceptability by being likable. And that strategy, whatever strategy that has been used for the past 20 plus years, was not able to prevent 40,000 of our own being slaughtered in Palestine. So what we need is a new strategy and a new philosophy 
and a new attitude when it comes to building power and power, as Sister Bahia said, starts with education. And power is the ability to name. How does evil operate? How does Shaitan operate? He renames the evil as good. He convinced Adam alayhi salam that what was evil, which was the disobedience of Allah, was the shajrat al-khud, right? What is the eternal fruit that was going to give him something uh, that was going to last forever? Renaming is a very, very crucial thing. So I want us to think as educators, not just at the level of creating curriculum and establishing facts. So that is important, but it's important and it's on everyone's radar. The one thing that I would like us also to think about are going beyond to question the framing and the naming and the system of naming that is currently in place. Because as the images that Sister Bahia showed us, there is more that is at play and that is being deployed against our children than just not factual information. There are stereotypes, there are assumptions, and those assumptions are about religious people and specifically about Muslims, in addition to about Arabs. We have, and Islamic schools have a unique duty to push back against what I call the secular bias. And we see this not only with the Zionist attitudes towards Palestine, but we also unfortunately see it in even Palestinian resistance or non-Muslim resistance against Zionism, where we have people in our own communities that they say that Palestine is not a religious issue. And they're half right. They're half right in the sense that not in the way that the Zionists understand it. It's not about Muslims and Jews always fighting. They've always been fighting. This is a lie. This is a misrepresentation of history. In fact, the Jews have been the most successful historically when they have been under the rule of Muslims. But that's not getting at the full truth that Palestine is an Islamic issue as well. Because every single time a child picks up a rock in Gaza, it has looked at as more barbaric and threatening than an Israeli pressing a button, wiping out tens or hundreds of people. Why is that true? That is because the secular bias. It is because secular violence is always seen as rational. It is always seen as limited. It is always seen as justified. And any self-defense in the name of la ilaha illallah, in the name of the shahada, in the name of the kalima, in the name of Islam, is seen as barbaric, it is seen as problematic, it is seen as inexcusable, and it cannot be allowed. If you're looking for a book recommendation, I recommend every single educator read The Myth of Religious Violence by William T. Kavanaugh. It is an extremely, extremely important book, and it shows an entire dimension to everything going on in Palestine that no one is talking about, and that the reason I'm bringing this up here, that Islamic schools are uniquely positioned to push back against. When it comes to the secular bias, we do not have to apologize for anything. Islam is not the religion of the Crusades. Islam is not the religion of the Inquisition. Islam is not the religion of the North Atlantic slave trade. Islam is not the religion of the wiping out of Native Americans. These are not our problems. And so we need to understand and also develop the curriculum and communicate to our children that we should not apologize for having an Islamic framework for the liberation of Palestine and having an Islamic framework for the elimination of Zionism and the end of the occupation. And that this is my challenge to all, to all educators. And I put it on myself first. I challenge myself as well, even when I teach tafsir, to push back against not just the facts, to make curriculums, but to also champion the framing. I was doing an interview with Yaqeen Institute with uh, Dr. Anasit Tikriti, and he said that if we only want a nation state, they will give us a nation state. They will give us the flag. They will give us a seat at the UN. But do we want just a nation state, just like Egypt has a nation state? Do we want a nation state just as Jordan has a nation state? What has this state done for them? The state is a tool. And what we want is justice. What we want is justice defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Islamic justice, which is not, and this is what makes Islam unique, not just justice for Muslims. This is why 
their accusation is actually a confession because when they say justice, it means justice only for them. When we say Islamic justice, we mean justice for the Muslim and justice for the Christian and justice for the Jew and justice for every single living creature, every single dabah on earth. That is what Islam came to, to humanity with, the promise of justice, non-partisan, non-sectarian justice for everybody. And Islamic schools have the unique duty and opportunity to right this wrong. And I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you all success and gives us all the courage and gives us all the abilities and the networking and the connections to prioritize this and to make it in the front of our minds and to not lose uh, our persistence. That just as the last 10 nights of Ramadan require persistence, the issue of freeing Palestine and ending the occupation of Palestine is going to take persistence. But just as Noor ad-Din Zengi commissioned the construction of the minbar 20 years before Palestine was liberated. I challenge every single one of you to build your own minbar, whatever it's going to be, if it's a class, if it's a curriculum, if it's a student that you take under your wing, that today is day one of the next 20 years, and inshallah, in 20 years, Palestine will be free on the anniversary, maybe let's say 24 years, in the 2048, inshallah ta'ala. What will be your minbar? What will be your contribution. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your time. Uh, sorry if I took too much time. Uh, may Allah forgive me for my shortcomings. I am honored to be among you, and I ask Allah to for, to uh, forgive us and guide us all. Barakallah fikum. Jazakum Allah khairan, Imam Tom, for that really inspirational and um, clear um, conversation and talk um, that I think that we all need. Really, subhanAllah, we have such a beautiful opportunity in our Islamic schools. We're really, truly blessed here in the United States. Yes, we hold an enormous responsibility given the funding, given the support, given the complicity that our country has in um, what is occurring right now. And we also have such a unique opportunity, an opportunity that many of our brothers and sisters who are joined from around the world in predominantly Muslim countries do not currently actually have. That they cannot say the word Palestine or make dua even, or have a unique curriculum even. Currently in the United States, our private schools can control and create their own unique curriculum. We are not beholden to any specific um, laws dictating what we do with our curriculum. So alhamdulillah, let us take advantage of that, inshallah. Help us build um, our toolkit, inshallah. Be a part of this. We're going to build it, inshallah. We will be creating it, inshallah, with your support or without your support. Be part of the support, inshallah. Let this be your excuse in front of Allah, inshallah. This is actually an underestimation. 50,000 is for one year of work. It's going to take so much longer, as Brother Imam, as Imam Tom has stated. So inshallah, be part of this with us, engage in whatever ways you can make dua, inshallah, especially in these last 10 nights, that we are successful, that we can help liberate. And inshallah, let us learn from our sister Quran, Shakir, about the beautiful example of those who have come before us, in particular that of Sister Clara Muhammad. Sister Quran will be telling us about her example of fighting against such oppression, such tyranny, tyranny here in the United States that continues and is perpetuated through our own institutions. And until we are aware of it, we are complicit and continuing that kind of um, oppression through our own Islamic schools, which we do not want to be a part of. So Alhamdulillah, it's my pleasure to introduce my dear beloved sister, Quran Shakir, who is a board member of the ISLA and also of the Clara Muhammad Schools Network. Sister Quran Shakir is a seasoned school leader and practitioner with 30 years of experience in education. She has consulted with public and private organizations and schools to develop and establish protocols, handbooks, school improvement plans, in addition to engaging in teacher coaching and curriculum audits, as well as curriculum development. Sister Quran is the co-owner of Celebrating Sacred Connections, an agency for honor honoring this scriptural beauty and power of women. Madam Q, as she is affectionately called, is an active board member of the ISLA and the Clara Muhammad Schools Network and the Interfaith Children's Movement, as well as a number of other organizations that I could not list here. Sister Quran, Jazakallah Khairan for joining us. Alhamdulillah, thank you so very much. And thank you, Imam Tom and, and Sister Bahia. We are so grateful for your contributions today. And I think it really goes to our theme today. So alhamdulillah, 
Thank you very much. And today, what I want to talk about is the Clara Muhammad School Network. Uh, I'm sorry, Clara Muhammad School, Sister Clara Muhammad, as a model of resistance. And I first bring you greetings from my community here in Atlanta, the Atlanta Masjid, and I say to you, Ramadan Mubarak. When we look at Sister Clara Muhammad, some of you may or may not know Clara Muhammad. So I want to introduce her to you first, just to tell you a little bit about her. She is the wife of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who was himself um, an African-American leader in our country. He led thousands of African-Americans to a reform where thinking about we were just 65 years up from emancipation, from enslavement. And so during this time, he, he's working to bring a sense of self to the African-Americans, a sense of self-determination, self-empowerment to those who were addicts and winos and the moribund of society because they have not yet uplifted themselves from that emancipation from enslavement. Sister Clara Muhammad being her husband and I mean, being the wife of um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Sister Clara Muhammad wanted her children to know their rich and noble history, something that was not taught in the public school system. She developed a school using her original curriculum that promoted the Nation of Islam's beliefs in the excellence of Black people and African-American-centered education while also teaching about the religion itself. She was a mother of six children, I'm sorry, eight children, and you see seven of them here. She had six boys and two girls, so this picture was taken before the last one was born, just to give you a picture of who she was. And so what we look at is this, what Allah tells us in the Quran is that he grants wisdom to whom he pleases and he to whom wisdom is granted receives indeed a benefit overflowing, but none will grasp the message, but people of understanding. So we have the duty then to gain understanding and to, to take this understanding and move it forward. Why? Because as we've heard from our previous speaker, Sister Bahia, Imam Tom, until the story of the hunt is told by the lion, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. That's an African proverb. So they control the narrative. They control what we see, what we hear, what we think, what we believe. That's called indoctrination. And that is what the hunter has the power to do unless the lion gets in the game and tells the story. So education then becomes liberation and liberation is a form of resistance. Liberation is necessary in order for us to change things. And this is the thinking, this is the Clara Muhammad had. She believed that education could be a tool for self-discovery and that liberation that most of her people did not have during this time of the 1930s. She believed that the European educational system was indoctrinating them with what they wanted them to believe. So they taught all of them at that time to hate their skin, to hate their history and to hate their very essence. How do we know? We know because of what we see in the curriculum. So one of my favorite uh, mentors, Dr. Asa Hilliard said, one of the primary ways that the Eurocentric lens maintains and perpetuates cultural hege hegemony is by promoting European history and culture as a superior while degrading and devaluing anything associated with Africa and people of African descent. We can and liken this to the same thing that's happening with Palestine right now. We can see where they take the same concepts and say we are superior and make someone else inferior. Such miseducation and Eurocentric cultural socialization processes have caused many people of African descent to internalize anti-African ideas. What does it do for our own children? What does it do for the Palestinians who hear and learn of this as well, who experience what they experience? That's what we have to put into our minds. To understand this, we have to understand the American system of education. It has been about prepping the people to be of value to society, to be what they want the people to be. So when we look at the educational system, it was designed 
to support what America wanted, not necessarily good for the individual. And when Dr. Goldie Muhammad comes up to speak, you'll see what she promotes as how education, how curriculum should guide the thinking of the individual so that individual can be their best selves to be able to meet the creator, number one, and also be of value. So, but the value is not just to benefit society. And this is more of that. So going back to Sister Clara Muhammad, she knew and understood the history of her people. She understood about the Moors from North Africa um, and how they ruled for hundreds of years. And when they ruled, that's, there was success in the world. We have Hannibal the Great. Masa Musa today is considered one of the wealthiest ever in the world. And what he did was make that, that trek from Mali to Mecca, going for Hajj, and along the way, he had all of his jewels with him and he made countries rich along the way. So imparting that, but that's not the history that we hear when we when our African-Americans were hearing about who they were. And that was the problem that Sister Claire Muhammad had with the public school system at that time. And I'm just sharing just a few of the things that Sister Claire Muhammad had in her heart that she wanted her children to know. She wanted them to know about their greatness and their wonderment that they have caused in the world because that's not what they heard in school. Usually when people start to tell the story of the African or the African-American, it is a story about um, the people uh, beginning with enslavement, not going back to that long history of how we actually began language for the world, how we actually develop the first library in the world. That's not what we hear. And so um, this was a concern to Sister Clara Muhammad because she wanted her children to know that when the conqueror, and we're very careful not to say the slave holder or the slave master, when the conqueror went to Africa, they did not go to Africa and get slaves. And again, careful about that term, they got, they enslaved the African and what they got were um, scientists, theologians, agriculturalists, 10 and 12 year old Hafiz of Quran. This is who they captured and brought to this country. These were highly intelligent leaders that they brought to this country who built this country. But that is not what you hear. When we hear about what happened um, for the Africans and the African Americans that we have today, it was like they rescued the African from a life of savagery. They were swinging from trees and they're one fifth of a person. They had their own agenda when they were sharing this. And we continue to see this when we look at even what the sister shared about what's going on with the curriculum that we see in the textbooks. This is what Sister Clara Muhammad was moving away from. And um, what we're looking at is that we need the kind of thinking, the kind of appreciation of, of ourselves, our self-view, our self-identity, where we identify ourselves not in the Europeans' history, but we identify ourselves in God's handiwork. And we find our worth and our purpose in God's handiwork, looking at what God has given us. So in educating our own, um, it allows us to control the narrative. And that's what we're talking about right now, controlling the narrative. So what does Sister Clara Muhammad do? She did as um, Dr. Carter G. Wilson, who who is the one who created for us Black History Month, she did just what he um, mentioned, and that is to look differently at the uh, education of the oppressor and to begin to develop her own educational system. So this was her form of resistance. She guided the Nation of Islam, which was the community led by her husband, during her husband's absence. He was in prison for nine years. And Two of those years, he was um, he was on a, a flight. So for 11 years, she was in charge of the community. And she um, withdrew her children from the public school. That's resistance because as you go back to the other slide, it was the law that children had to go to public school if they were not in a private school that was approved by the government. So she drew her, withdrew her children from public school. And she began to homeschool them. She was breaking the law. And when she did this in her home, what she did was she said, anybody in this community that can read will be a teacher. So she had 
a 15 year old who was teaching 50 and 60 year olds. Remember 65 years up from emancipation. So these are the people who it was illegal for them to learn to read and write while they were enslaved. And so many of them still didn't know how to read and write. So now when we think about the school she started, sometimes we think only of children. She had adults in her school as well because everybody needed to be literate. So in 1931, she pioneered the primary and secondary independent schools of the Nation of Islam. And she established them eventually on a national scale by the 1950s. Because her children were not going to school, she was considered to be breaking the law of truancy. And many of the members of the community, and I've talked to some of them and some of their children and grandchildren were put in jail and their children were taken from them because they did not follow this law. And that's what happens when you are resisting then they consider you a lawbreaker and they're going to use their tools to imprison you. Because of her resistance by 1950 in Illinois, um, Seventh-day Adventists had filed the lawsuit, but Sister Clara Muhammad had done the battle from the 30s to the 50s for this homeschooling and it became um, now legal to homeschool your children. So her resistance paid off. Sister Clara Muhammad's stance became our country's first home school. And the school had a focus on a great and greater destiny for these people that I just described who were struggling people, people who were working to uplift themselves. And within 35 to 40 years, there were an estimated 40 plus schools around the United States. Her goal, her number one goal was empower her children through an appreciation of their history as timeless scientists, timeless mathematicians and theorists and leaders since the beginning of time. And when I say her children, that's all of the African and African-American children. That was her goal. And she met it through that resistance of not giving in to sending her children to the school of quote unquote, the devil. Her husband said, you have to know yourself so you can love yourself. So you can do for self and do for self was the mantra and the practice of the nation of Islam and under the leadership of her husband, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the sister Clara Muhammad promoting that within the school system. Her famous words when the police came to her home to take her children away and to take her to prison for breaking the law was I'll be deader than this doorknob before I send my children to your devil school meaning the public school. So she took a stance. How many of us are willing to take a stance and say, I'll be deader than this doorknob before I continue to let you teach my children this curriculum that is not in their best interest. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, says, we will surely test you with a touch of fear and famine and loss of property, life and crops. He says, so give good news to those who patiently persevere who say when struck by a disaster, surely to Allah we belong and to him we will all return. I'm saying this to us to be reminded our brothers and sisters in Palestine are struggling. And we cannot let fear move us to not do what we need to do to take a stance. And our stance can be bigger than the ability to pick up a gun. Our guns can be what we do as Sister Clara Muhammad did work toward educating our children, giving them the best curriculum that there is, helping them to understand and be empowered to make a difference, their own difference. And Allah said, there's a um, attribute of Allah, the responding one. So we have to be those who respond, be the hearkener, the one who answers the one in need if he asks and rescues the yearn if he calls upon him. Thank you, dear beloved brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our existence in this country of benefit. When we look at from Palestine to America, we have a responsibility. We have a duty. Our resistance is ours and we can make a difference, inshallah. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. Thank you so much, Sister Quran, for teaching us about our history, about the resilience and the courage and the brilliance of our sister, Clara Muhammad in establishing the first um, homeschool and the first system of Islamic education in the United States. We're reaching, inshallah, 100 years thanks to her foundational work and the work of others um, with her. And there's so much that we have to learn and continue to carry on through her legacy, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khair and Sister Quran. 
At this time, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Nadim to take the mic. Um, Dr. Nadim is the chairperson of the ISLA. Um, he is also uh, the senior research, a senior research fellow and program director for the Islamic Education in the Center for Islamic Thought and Education in the School of Education at the University of Southern Australia. His research focuses on teacher education with a particular emphasis on Islamic pedagogy, comparative faith-based schooling, philosophy of religious education, and culturally relevant and responsive teaching. He currently serves as ISLA's board president. He's also the author of numerous articles and books. I've only listed one here, including A History of Islamic Schooling in North America. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Nadim, for joining us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah rahman rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassili amri wa halal uqtata mi lisani yakaw kawli. On behalf of... Um, the ISLA board, um, I'd like to just welcome everyone I, again. Uh, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to have all of you here. And it's an honor to follow um, Sister Quran, Imam Tom, Sister Bahia, mashallah, some amazing presentations uh, thus far. And I, re I really just, I will pick up on where they left off um, and provide a provocation that hopefully shapes um, the thoughts that I'd like to share, uh, which really picks up from uh, what Imam Tom mentioned about us pushing back um, as a sector of Islamic schools. The sector or the field, I guess my provocation is that the sector or the field of Islamic schooling needs to lead right now. We collectively need to lead. And when I say field, <clears throat> I'm not just talking about the educators, but I'm speaking about the students, the teachers, the board members, the school leaders, the parents, and even the researchers that are working uh, for and in the field of Islamic schooling. We have to remember that after our masajid, we are the second largest Muslim institution um, that has something to offer. And we are arguably the educational arm of our community. We also have to remember that, uh, as Sister Bahia mentioned, the the vast majority of our Muslim students uh, will be attending state schools. We have about approximately 5% of our Muslim age students who attend Islamic schools, which is actually uh, an opportunity. Um, we may see it as, we may see it as uh, our schools need to grow more, which, which could be the case. But at the same time, we have to understand why our schools offer something distinct. And this builds from what Sister Quran mentioned about our legacy of schools that have come out of the Clara Muhammad schools. Um, and, and that is that we didn't establish these schools necessarily to just isolate ourselves or to create safe havens. We established our Islamic schools to offer a distinct education that is deeply grounded in an Islamic conception of education. For us, that means ma'rifa, to know God. <clears throat> and we achieve ma'rifa through fostering taqwa in our schools or God consciousness. And we achieve God consciousness through a pedagogy that is distinctly based on a model of tarbiyah, of nurturing wholeness. The academic achievement part is the easy part, I would argue. But we have something far more special to offer. So when an Islamic school develops an innovative tarbiyah program, or a cross-curricular focus on ihsan, on excellence, on holistic excellence, or a, student, a senior student course on Islamic worldview. Heads turn. Islamic schools globally want a piece of it because we realize it's something special. So I would argue that Islamic schools are essentially an incubator of, for creativity in education a place to develop a unique educational model that fosters wholeness. So when we say, for example, this afternoon, this evening, this morning, at least for some of us, when we say from Palestine to America, we have an opportunity to lead, not solely for, as we would do in with the socialist lobby for political justice, not solely as we would advocate for the end of oppression, but as Imam Zaid Shakir has spoken about, our end goal isn't just social justice. Social justice is one, one, 
one um, milestone for us. Our end goal is social mercy. When we achieve social justice, we want to spread social mercy. So as an educational arm, it's our role to advance a way to make sense of the world that we live in. And we know that for us as educators um, and those of us that work with Islamic schools, the vibe amongst young people today is a sense of helplessness. We know our young people in our schools are feeling, are, are making sincere dua. They've made dua and they're continuing to make sincere dua. They're protesting, we're raising funds, we're creating awareness, but young people still have some big questions that are that continue to remain under discussed in our Islamic schools. Questions like why does Allah allow for injustice to perpetuate? How do we make sense of calamity? What is our responsibility in a world that feels overwhelmingly consumed by injustice and oppression? So to play our part as ISLA, we are guided by three strategic pillars that are trying to advance a distinct model of education. And these three st strategic pillars are Islamically grounded, research-informed, professional communities of practice. Islamically grounded is our, is our foundation. We acknowledge that Islamic schools are subtly influenced, as Imam Tom spoke about, um, that secular bias. We're commonly adopting what we call, quote unquote, best practices, as Sister Bahia mentioned with textbooks. We're adopting textbooks and best practices, teacher training, professional learning, curriculum, accreditation standards that are replete with the same isms and ideologies, void of a recognition of the metaphysical, void of a recognition of the spiritual, and void of a recognition of the ontological commitments of Islam. If we're going to lead educationally with curricular resources or professional learning, they need to be grounded in an Islamic worldview. Among indigenous education scholars, a worldview is commonly defined as ways of knowing, being, and doing. For us, this is beyond Islamic values and religious practices. This is grounding our work in how Islam sees the world and our place as human beings in it. <clears throat> as Sister Quran mentioned, in the 70s, when the Clara Muhammad schools were going through a process of renewal, Imam Warth Deen, may Allah have mercy on him, is often quoted as saying, the Quran is the curriculum. And at that time and to date, it is a profound statement because he was emphasizing the centrality of our worldview in how we shape our curriculum and the work that we do in our schools. The second pillar, research informed is a recognition of how blessed we are as a field for a blossoming field for not only schools but academics like myself and others and institutions of higher education that are now inspiring renewed thinking among islamic schools we have two leading academics with us today who are going to join us dr goldie muhammad and dr muhammad khalifa we also have organizations or institutions like bayan colleges Masters of Education in Islamic Education, and the work of the Center of Islam in the Contemporary World, CICW, at Shenandoah University, and their thought leadership on prophetic pedagogy. At ISLA, we're trying to build on, 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 on work like this, where we're making a concerted effort to draw from the research that is deeply theoretically grounded in the Islamic tradition and relevant to the context of American Islam. Lastly, our third pillar is professional communities of practice, and that speaks to us as educators. Our field of American Islamic schooling boasts a living legacy that dates back to the 1930s, as Sister Quran mentioned. We have a commitment of strong intentionality of Nia, a recognition of our shared amana or trust, and we have a wealth of exp expertise, energy, passionate educators that bring a wealth of experience to the table. So ISLA strives to foster a sense of community across schools where we may draw from one another. I'll say this to, to close, that um, ISLA is one piece of this puzzle, uh, but we know that we're at a critical juncture where the leadership of our field is needed. And, and I'll, I'll close with the words of um, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, 
in the UK. In his recent book uh, entitled Traveling Home, he speaks about Islam offering a healing for the world. And I get stuck on the word healing because it's so critical to the work that we do. When the world feels like it's in disarray, it's through education that we can inspire wholeness again. And that's our task uh, today and as educators for tomorrow. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair and uh, Dr. Nadim for joining us. Um, it's just past Sahur time over there, Fajr time in Australia. And uh, you've left us with some inspiring words and um, provocative thoughts, questions to ask ourselves. Um, what role do we have? What is our responsibility? How do we root this in our Islamic tradition from every perspective and angle in our Islamic schools here in the United States and across the world? And we look forward to hearing from um, our other speakers as well. And we want to remind you, we are seeking your support, inshallah, through your engagement, um, giving us your input, the resources that you might have, perhaps sharing some leads with us, um, offering your expertise, and of course, also supporting this very modest um, project goal of $50,000 to create a vital toolkit for our Islamic schools. As we've been engaging in this work, we've been talking to Islamic school leaders about how are they teaching about Palestine in their Islamic schools. And we look forward to having Dr. Muhammad Khalifa speak a little bit to the answers that we've received from our Islamic school educators. We have to be aware of the realities that our Islamic schools are functioning in. There is a sense of fear in speaking out, just as we imagine and we know that our sister Clara Muhammad, our our, our mother, if we can call her so, had when she was faced with the policeman at her door, but the courage that she had, subhanAllah. So how do we balance these um, different feelings? Dr. Muhammad Khalifa has been invited to join us because he is an expert in, in, in educational leadership. He is a professor of educational administration and the executive director for urban education initiatives at Ohio State University. In addition, Dr. Khalifa previously held the Robert Beck Endowed Professorship in the Department of Organizational Leadership Policy and Development at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. Having worked as a public school teacher and administrator in Detroit, no easy feat, I'm sure, Dr. Khalifa's research examines how urban school leaders enact culturally responsive leadership practices. His latest book, Culturally Responsive School Leadership, was published by Harvard Education Press he is the first to develop and use an on online equity audits for schools. And Dr. Khalifa's school leadership expands beyond the um, boundaries of the United States to across the world. I think Dr. Khalifa also has some very interesting roots with the Clara Muhammad school system from what I recall from our last conversation. We really look forward to um, hearing from you, Dr. Khalifa, and we're honored to have you joining us. Wow, Zakalakh, my sister. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's, uh... Uh, great pleasure and delight for me to be with you all. Ramadan Mubarak to you all. Um, I'm sorry I came on the, the call a little bit late. I've got some issues with my ear right now. So uh, if I can't hear you or something like that, then there is a reason for that. Uh, so, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasul al-Kareem. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Um, I, I was so happy to hear uh, my uh, my brother uh, Nadim talking about uh, Claire Muhammad and the legacy with Claire Muhammad and Sister Quran. I'm happy that you brought that in. As as um, as one of my father was the first principal at Claire Muhammad uh, in Detroit. He was the inaugural principal under uh, Dr. Abdul Alim Shabazz. Uh, this is like in the late '70s, early '80s, and um, so that, that was that's where it, it was. What I loved about the school is it's not only that it was just a Muslim school. It was it was a school. It was a place of love, of deep, like radical love. Uh, uh, it's so much so that probably 20 percent of my classmates were not Muslim. A lot of people don't know this history about Claire Muhammad schools, but um, many of the, the the folks in the community has such admiration, uh, uh, admiration and respect for what the community was doing, uh, what that school was doing in the community, how visible they, how, they, I should say how hyper visible they were, how committed they were to the people of the community. Uh, a lot of people uh, unfortunately forget about this aspect of justice and how justice is not just critique, but justice, and, and it's not just deconstructive. 
but justice is reconstructive. It's building. It's rooted in community. Um, I, I, I challenge us. How many people can say that our schools and our communities are such a light for the community that people around the school who are not Muslim want to come to that institution? Not, not just for a visit, for a Ramadan meal, but to attend the institution, to send their children to a Muslim school. But that's how much of a light those schools were in many cities across America. And I can speak personally about the one in Detroit because I was there with many of them. And I, I was raised with them and there was no discrimination for them because I didn't even know they were not, they were not Muslim. That's how welcome they were in the community. I didn't recognize and realize that they were not Muslim. But I've been asked to speak a little bit about a different topic, but I just had to kind of add that out there um, first. So I was asked to, to, to answer a couple of questions, and I have some thoughts about that. One is, what's the role of the leader? Um, well, first of all, in, in upholding justice and how this ties to Islam, Allah is very explicit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very explicit in the Quran. None of us have any problem with what's within the Quran. Allah says in multiple verses that, that's one verse in Surah Al Hadid. And there are many other verses in which and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly says for us to be upholders of justice. Now, the problem comes though is when many people who are in the Muslim community don't understand what justice looks like or oppression looks like in this in this current era, right? So some people are still understanding that to be. Uh, along the lines, uh, lines of Judaism and Christianity, differences like these between religious differences. And you should know, like, just to give you an example, most of our past four or five presidents aren't really Christian. They're nothing. What they are are glo global capitalists and colonialists. But what does global capitalism mean? What does coloniality mean? Like, how are these terms that are not even on the in the lexicon or the thought process of current Muslims in the Muslim community? So what that means is that you can't recognize injustice because it's invisible to you. That's what that means. That's why I'm bringing that up. It's invisible to you if you're a reproducer of global capitalistic behaviors and you have essentialized a child to test scores or something else, which is a practice within neoliberalism, which ties to a certain worldview that's very antithetical to Islam. And you can't recognize that. You're just grabbing onto best practices and you end up reproducing oppressive context. Well, justice uh, has to go a little bit deeper than just you know mentioning uh, coming out to this march when George Floyd is killed or you know uh, with Palestine or something like that. That's reactionary. How can we lead with a different example, which is what my brother Nadim, I think, uh, started to get to. Um, so I'll say a few things about school leadership and make my remarks very, uh, very short. First of all, the buck stops with the leader. I mean, I, I, I love what teachers are doing and what they do is essential. But multiple studies have now confirmed that the most important person, if there could be one person in a school to make sure that teachers are teaching in ways they should or what they have, what they need, that they're encouraged, that they get proper feedback, good feedback to be culturally responsive to the students. The leader does this to, to make sure that when new people are hired, that they are willing to, they're not going to be prepared at that moment, but that they're willing to grow into becoming a justice oriented, a socially uh, justice oriented and a culturally responsive oriented uh, teacher that they have the propensity or the, the capacity or willingness to grow into that. Well, that person is also the leader. The one that takes school resources and pushes it to the school that allows the teachers to go to the community in ways that they don't have to give up free labor to do that. Well, that person is also the leader. The one who's an instructional leader, who is coaching, who's mentoring, that's the school leader. So, so there are, in fact, according to my own research, you know, four core areas that um, justice-oriented leaders need to be kind of aware of. Number one, critical self-reflection. Uh, I, I, I uh, cannot tell you how many times I've talked to Islamic school folk who are on Saturday night marching for Palestine and on Sunday night, market, marching for George Floyd, and on Monday morning in the school, preferring their own community members over others in their same school. What kind of, what kind of, you talk about white supremacy, and then you come with immigrant supremacy. It doesn't really make sense. But you can't see if you're doing that, right? So sometimes we need help 
So critical self-reflection, which is one of four areas, there are four areas I'm going to briefly talk about. Critical self-reflection requires you to ask yourself, how are you reproducing oppressive context possibly on people in your school? I'm not talking about other Islamic schools. I'm talking about you as a person. Uh, and is it happening? How do you know it's not happening? I don't need anecdotes. I don't need your anecdotal data. I need independently verified data. And I'm going to talk about a little bit of ways that I can know that everybody in your school from Somalia or from Ethiopia or from Burma or from some other area that they don't have the big bucks like some community members may have, that they are not underrepresented, that they're treated exactly the same as everybody else in the school when they do the same thing that the other ones did, right? So another, another that's one area. Another, the second area that I'm going to talk about is community engagement. Community engagement does not mean um, domesticating parents and community members. That's not what it means. Community engagement means how can you get knowledge, the ancestral knowledge is from everybody in your community and begin to bring that into schools. How can you give people in the community's power to weigh in on what happens in your schools? Community engagement, if you're, if you're inheriting them from white Americans, generally that means I want to train the parent to support whatever the school's goals are. A more liberatory, though, interpretation is I want to partner with parents so that we can co-lead this space right now. That's a very different and a paradigmatic shift from how many of us, because unfortunately, many of us, we came here uh, and we started to inherit what was there in Islamic schools. Claire Muhammad schools is also an outlier in this regard. They did not do that. Almost every teacher in the building when I was growing up in Claire Muhammad schools, I, they were familiar to me. They were all community members. They were hired from the community. They were all people who I would see everywhere, all over the place, uh, in, and it's, uh, in and outside of the Muslim, the, the masjid is what I'm saying, in Detroit, right? In and around Detroit. So that's kind of what community engagement needs to look like. Another area, that's the second area, community engagement. The third one is, of course, school climate and culture. Um, when parents of certain ethnicities or certain economic statuses, like let's say parents on scholarship, for example, everybody, everybody's school looks different, right? You, it may be in your school, everybody who gets scholarship is treated differently from the parents who pay full tuition. I don't know. That's the research you have to do, though. But let's just say, for example, it's the ones who get scholarship. And when they come into the building, they're treated differently. So school climate is measured in a, in a multitude of ways. How do they feel when they're on the, en route to school? How do they feel when they're in the classroom? Do they see themselves reflected in the curriculum or is it all Arab based or is it all Desi based? Is it, do you have curriculum and stories and things like that from Africa, from uh, Southeast, from South Asia, Southeast Asia? Uh, what, what you, you know, because there are students like that in your schools. And so um, when we talk about community engagement and, 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 and uh, cl school climate, these are intricately linked because that is a doorway, a pathway for you to bring other curriculum content into your classrooms because nobody can come and give you that. You have to get that from the resources that are in and around your building. And so school climate, um, I need to know when I go into the office, when in the classroom, or some, I need to look at your discipline data, who's suspended more than others in your building. These are the traditional ways of finding that. And then the fourth way, the fourth quadrant or the fourth, uh, let's say, um, area of, of, of leadership that I, I like to call out today is um, instructional leadership. And that is how you lead instruction, how you lead professional development, um, how you uh, hire and, and, and train and coach teachers and all of that, that whole aspect, how, how you as a leader can improve the instruction of your teachers, because when they come to you, they don't have everything they need. And how can you weave justice into this? And then the last question that our sister Shaza asked me to uh, react to is what are some concrete things that we can do um, to, to, to kind of make sure that our schools are more justice inclined. I, I wanted, I wanted to say some things about coloniality and how colonization, uh, showed up in the way in the space today and how some Muslims are very, uh, about anti-blackness and they're about, and, you know, being against white supremacy and all of the other types of oppression, which is necessary, but then they, they don't have the same lens in order to cr critique critical theories as well. So, they they they're shooting down the train tracks with Franz Fanon, who I won't get into that. Are, we're Muslims. 
we're not extreme left. We're not extreme right. If something makes sense from the right, we take it. If something makes sense from the left, we take it. Islam, the Quran is, is our is our goalpost with that. Um, but to, to get to the four practical things. So there's there one of the ways to be decolonial in schooling, but to be also so decoloniality has to come with ancestral knowledge and community building. You can't just be one. And one of the ways to get that is to is to kind of get begin to get knowledge. The ancestral knowledge is from the communities around us. One way to do that is through is youth led research. It's called youth participatory action research, YPAR. That's one way. So young people are out engaging, asking questions, collect asking asking questions, collecting data from the community, and then writing that research up. This gives power to young people to use their voice and to use knowledge from the community to improve schools, and to and to get them more interested in remaining in your school. Uh, another thing that you can use is equity audits. Equity audits has is, is become a, a, a wildly popular tool in schools across the U.S. I haven't seen any Muslim schools doing it. You need to go to the people who are new in your community, who are poor in your community, who are black in your community, if that's the, if that's the group that is marginalized. And you need to ask them and their parents how they're experiencing your school. What's missing? What can be added? All of these kind of things, right? And it can't be your anecdotal stuff. And your board probably doesn't know. So you have to do this research. Another one is independent observers. You need independence of thought, not people who are going to give you the, you're going to share it in the same kind of Kool-Aid and everybody's going to drink the same Kool-Aid, telling yourselves how good you are. And then uh, community research projects are another possibility. I know that my time has expired and I, and I know that this is an intense, uh, tightly packed program. So let me let me stop my comments there. Barak al and I, I wish you all the best, inshallah. Ramadan Mubarak. May Allah accept your fast, your qiyam, in these last ten, in, in, and in these last ten days, free us all from the fire, inshallah. Amen. Amen. Um, Jazakallah khairan, um, Dr. Sharif. Not Dr. Sharif. I see Dr. Sharif al Maki also joining us. We have giants in education, mashallah, joining us, and it's such an honor to have you here with us, um, Dr. Khalifa, and to share these really practical. Um, strategies for us to be using questions for us to be asking and we appreciate even if it's hard to swallow the honesty um, because we're not going to move forward we're not going to elevate our schools unless if we do this hard work and um, you know sometimes uh, it's easier to feel as though we're the ones suffering and there's a lot happening and, and it's true we are witnessing grave injustices against our brothers and sisters and against ourselves and it can also be true that we are also complicit and participating and perpetuating those same systems and we don't want to be doing that so we appreciate you dr khalifa the work that you do i pray that you um have shifa and whatever is great giving you some pain in every way possible thank you so much for joining us at this point, we have, I mean, <laughs> thank you so much. I'd like to now introduce another amazing human being, inshallah, that we can learn so much from, um, Dr. Goldie Muhammad, joining us uh, as a professor from the University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, she's an associate professor of literacy, language, and culture there, and she studies Black historical excellence within educational communities with the goals of reframing curriculum and instruction today. Dr. Muhammad's scholarship has appeared in leading academics, uh, academic journals and books. She's won awards for being the top influencer. Uh, I don't think that's the language being used, Dr. Goldie, I apologize, in the sphere of education and academic thought. And she is the author of two best-selling books, um, Cultivating Genius, an Equity Model for Culturally and Historically Responsive Literacy, and Unearthing Joy. Her historically responsive literacy and culturally and historically responsive educational model has been adopted across U.S. school districts, and we invite our Islamic schools to learn more about it by having Dr. Goldie share with us at least one piece of this, which is so key and so crucial to um, overcoming the oppressions and the marginalization that we have seen and have our brothers and sisters have faced in this country, in the United States, in particular with our African-American brothers and sisters, as well as around the world. There is so much that we need to be learning from each other. Dr. Um, Goldie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum and Ramadan Mubarak. Thank you to Sister Quran, Dr. Khan, thank you uh, for all that you do in your leadership and Sister Quran and Brother Muhammad Khalifa, 
you all have been such great mentors for me. So everything that I do, you know, is, is really stem from your leadership and your guidance too. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here and, you know, in about 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about the work, particularly as it relates to how we can teach this thing of criticality, of justice, of equity in our schools. And so I wrote these two books to really address this need of centering Black, Brown, Indigenous, Genius, Justice, and Joy. Uh, these things are largely absent and erased, as we know, in our schools. And although this work has been adopted in 42 states, um, mostly public schools that are not Islamic schools, please know I'll stop the world and come speak <laughs> or, or do the work for our schools first, because that's where it all stemmed from, doing the work in Muhammad schools in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my work stems from the deeply rooted oppressive histories in the US. And these are two examples of it. Um, the first is the measuring rod of textbook selection in 1850. This book basically was written to forbid any kind of curriculum textbooks about black people, brown people, Muslims in the US. They said, don't add it, erase it completely and only speak about whiteness and white people who were oppressive oppressors of the time, only speak about them as good and just and fair. And so the sister who shared about the curriculum when we see curriculum being indoctrinated negatively, when we see curriculum today being banned, when we see Black people, Muslim people being banned from being taught the truth, Islamophobia being banned, we know that this is not a thing that's new. This has always been um, a, 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 an agenda. <laughs> I was trying to find the right word. The agenda in the United States. The second example, and one of the examples that stem the need for my work too, is uh, one of our United States superintendents, right? Richard Henry Pratt, who oppressed indigenous people and, uh, and black people in the United States and brown people. Um, he created this school, indigenous boarding schools, we might know well, um, and it was genocide posed as American education. And what they did was they stripped away indigenous people's names, their culture, their language, everything that made them culturally them. And he was famously known for saying, kill the Indian, save the man, like become more white, become more like us. And we're seeing that being the message, the thread throughout the talk as we talk about leadership and as we talk about curriculum. So what I did was go back into Black history in the United States to understand, well, what were some of their goals for education, which they named as pursuits? And they had five pursuits to say that this is what our children deeply need and deserve. They said our children must have identity with every lesson plan, every unit plan within the curriculum. We must teach them to deeply know their cultural roots. In the case of Islam, right, deeply know who they are as Muslims, who they're not, who they desire to be. They said, number two, teach them the skills and proficiencies that are needed in content areas like mathematics, science, social studies, and language, and literacy. They said, number three, teach them intellect, knowledge set into action. Don't just teach knowledge that stays in your mind. Teach knowledge where they can take the knowledge and put it into action within their communities. And then once you have intellectualism, teach criticality. Criticality is the naming, understanding, questioning, and the disruption of hurt, pain, and harm in the world, which I'll talk about. This is gonna be my focal point. And then joy. You know, while we see our freedom fighters, our brothers, our Muslim brothers and sisters fighting for many things in Palestine and around the world, what we're really fighting for is to have joy is to have beauty, is to practice, to pray and practice and celebrate Ramadan. This is what all freedom fighters, abolitionists across time and social movements, they are fighting for joy. But I wanna hone in on the criticality pursuit. Criticality is when we teach our children liberation, freedom, anti-racism, self-determination, how to read in between the lines of media. What is media saying and not saying? 
be able to discern between truth and falsehood. That's what criticality does. And criticality, I mean, all five pursuits, and I'm writing about all five pursuits and how it connects to the Quran and Islam right now. All five pursuits is Islam. <laughs> Clearly, criticality is especially, I'm not going to say joy is especially Islam. Identity is especially Islam. But criticality feels especially Islamic, right? We read about justice throughout the Quran. We read about how Allah teaches us to stand firm on justice. So with criticality, we're asking ourselves as educators, how does my teaching help our children to name, understand, disrupt inequalities, injustices like genocide that we're seeing right now? And it's also about criticality more broadly is about any injustice. It can be the injustice of, an env of the environment, how we take care of our land, our grass, our living organisms, how we take care of ourselves, right? What we put into our bodies. How do we harm ourselves, right? With negative self-talk, the foods we put in our bodies and so forth and so on. And then criticality mostly, of course, is when we think of largely about humanity and human beings. And when you study, when we all know and study Islam, Islam stands with marginalized people, oppressed people. When I studied the history of criticality, the ancestors, Black ancestors wrote in 1827 that criticality will enlarge our powers of reasoning and enable us to detect at a glance whenever we hear sophistry. Sophistry is a fancy word for falsehood, for fake news, <laughs> for ridiculousness and foolishness, right? When we want, we want to teach our children that, that you can detect falsehood at a glance. In the media, as Brother Malcolm said, because um, the media, as we learned, has been a tool to control folks and to control our children. And what's happening is like curriculum is sort of like um, an aspect of media. When they try to control media, they try to control curriculum. They're not banning songs and Netflix, they're banning curriculum because they know that when you teach generations of children, you're teaching the next generations of children and the next after that. So we have seen throughout social movements, we've seen when we turn on the news, right? the incomplete narratives, the false narratives, the lies that are being told. This is why we need to help children to embrace criticality so that when they take in anything, literature, music, media, the news, that they don't consume it uh, passively and take in everything as truth. They critique it. They know uh, 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 that's not true. Or why did they not say that the six-year-old that was killed in Chicago, why didn't they even name him a Muslim in the news, right? Why did that story not get a lot of coverage at all? This is what criticality helps to, um, helps our children with. And so we started with this model, as I said, in the Clara Muhammad schools in Atlanta, and started to say, well, what happens if all the curriculum looks in this way, right? What happens if our curriculum, every single lesson plan or unit plan, our children are learning across these five pursuits? And so, of course, we added uh, the Quran to every lesson plan. So these are, I want to show you just a couple of examples that I'm doing, that uh, Muslims educators are doing across the country to teach not just these five pursuits and criticality, but also to teach the truth, to bring awareness about Palestinians, about Gaza, about genocide that's happening there. This was an example of Baba, what does my name mean? Like a kindergarten lesson, picture book, where we teach children for identity. What is the beauty? What is the meaning behind your name? Uh, for skills, they're learning how to write their names. They're learning their letters, their sounds. All of those are proficiencies. Intellect, they learn about naming traditions across our people, across Muslims, across Palestinian culture. Criticality, how are some names treated unfairly, unjustly, kindergarten, in society? And how do we respond with righteousness? And then with joy, what are the beautiful and happy, right, memories and nicknames or whatever we have, beloved names in our family. 
And then how do we learn the 99 beautiful names of Allah? How do we learn the Quranic verses, right? About the names of Allah. This was a beautiful example that was shared online by the sister Tala. She is a Muslim who's teaching about Palestine. I just, I just want to show you all this and I'm going to, I'm going to put in the chat and I have a QR code to these examples, right? So don't feel like you, I mean, you could take a screenshot, but you don't have to kind of memorize any of this, but this was an example about teaching about pride of Palestine, but also teaching about figurative language and colonization and um, how to, what to do when you face an injustice for criticality. Um, she had one more example of teaching about how you can help children love their country and their people and learn about the cultural artifacts, learn about how to rise up for what is right. So you do this now as a kid, you do it as a grown up, and then learn the joy of the people. So none of us, none of our people started with oppression. The story does not begin with what people have done to us, how they have hurt us and oppressed us. Our story begins with who we are deeply, our joys, our identities. And that's what she was really trying to come across with joy. So there is, I'm gonna put in a QR code where you can see all of the um, weeks of resources she created as more curriculum for you all. And I close with just this, what are the benefits of criticality and teaching it and where do we really begin? Um, if I could, there's so many benefits, right? And if I could sort of narrow it down to four, um, we're really helping to nurture and cultivate the pious, righteous, hu humane human, right? One that will go into this world and make it better and not inflict more hurt and harm, even in implicit ways, in smaller ways. Uh, one, it helps children to name the injustice so that they don't repeat it, helping them to make the world a better place. It helps them to tell the truth even when it gets hard and difficult, because certainly like as a Muslim black woman doing this work, it's not always easy for me. You know, the hate mail threats that I get, you know, just for telling the truth and sometimes just for talking about joy, the joy that Muslim children deserve and need. And lastly, it helps to ensure joy. There is no joy without justice. You know, they have a beautiful relationship, criticality, is meant to be because when you begin to erase or dismantle systemic racism, Islamophobia and oppression, of course, in schools, that's when joy can enter the body, enter the land, the society. And so as educators, these are some questions to consider asking yourself, what am I teaching and how does it relate to equity, marginalization, exploitation, racism, sexism, any kind of type of inequities? What, why am I teaching this now? We have to have urgent pedagogies. Sometimes we need to stop and say, this is what's happening in the world, we must teach it. And sort of disrupt that textbook or whatever the pacing guide is. And why must our students know this? Why now and what unlearning needs to be done? So again, I'm going to uh, put the slide deck for this uh, deck including the Palestinian uh, teaching resources. I'll put both links in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldie, for joining us um, and, and really sharing with us from your work and from your expertise and giving us practical tools for teachers as well, for what they can do in the classroom to help our students become more critical consumers and critical users, creators, inshallah, of um, what is is being shared and and having a say, inshallah, in the narrative and the way that it is being um, presented, as well as inshallah being able to create that narrative as well through a critical perspective. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldie. Mashallah, I see so many wonderful people here with us. Brother Ahmed Al Hattab from CICW, Jazakallah Khair for joining us. Um, at this time, I'm so honored to have, um, to introduce Professor Muhammad Abdullah. He is um, joining us from Australia shortly after Fajr Salah over there the next day. I always find that fascinating. Um, they are now in the 22nd day of uh, Ramadan, SubhanAllah. 
Professor Muhammad Abdullah has dedicated over 25 years to the field of Islamic studies, notably founding key research and educational institutions in Australia, including Griffith University Islamic Research at the Griffith University and the prestigious National Center of Excellence for Islamic Studies in collaboration with multiple universities. He was recognized with a member of the Order of Australia in 2020. It is the highest honor that can be um, given honor, uh, presented to someone for significant contributions to the field of education. And he currently serves as the founding director of the Center for Islamic Thought and Education at University of South Australia. Professor Abdullah has edited and authored several articles and scholarly books. I shared just one title with you, um, Curriculum Renewal for mm -hmm. Islamic Education. Professor Abdullah also um, traces his roots back to um, the to Palestine, and we are honored to have you here with us, um, Professor Abdullah, to share with us some words that can um, give us, inshallah, educate, empower, and inspire us. Jazakallah khair for joining. Wayaki. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, amma ba'du, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Uh, first, I must begin by the beautiful teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who uh, told us, la yashkuru allaha man la yashkuru nas, uh, he, whosoever does not thank people will not be able to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So thank you very much, Jazakumullah Khair, for inviting me. I'm honored. And thanks to all the previous uh, speakers, I have benefited tremendously from your wisdom. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to implement what we have heard, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us ikhlas, sincerity in what we say and what we do. And I've been asked to speak about three things. What is the religious significance of teaching about Palestine in Islamic schools? What happens if or when Islamic schools don't create and implement their own curriculum in Islamic schools uh, when teaching about Palestine? And why is it critical for Muslims to invest in well-researched and vetted educational resources on Palestine at this moment? And before I begin answering those uh, important questions, allow me to quote a hadith uh, to all of us. Uh, it's a sahih hadith narrated by Hakim and Bayhaqi, and it is sahih according to Imam Bukhari, alayhi. And it has so much relevance to what is happening to us, both in the, the fact that we are in Ramadan and each one of us is trying to search for Laylatul Qadr and uh, when Laylatul Qadr and experience Laylatul Qadr and what's happening in Palestine at the moment, in Gaza particularly. Uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu maqal anna nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal ala unabbi'ukum bi laylatin afdala min laylatul qadr harisun harasa fi ardi khawfin la'allahu alla yarja'a ila ahlih. And this hadith applies to every man, woman, child in Gaza at the moment. Uh, Rasulullah said, Shall I not tell you about a night that is better than Laylatul Qadr? Uh, which is quite fascinating because everybody's focused on Laylatul Qadr. And here's Rasulullah said, Shall I tell you about a night that is better than Laylatul Qadr? Uh, a God who stood watch in a land of danger fearing he may, he may or she may not return to their family. People who are defending their land for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, and they are not sure if they will go back to their family. Uh, so this person, one night of this person is better than Laylatul Qadr. And this gives you an indication of the tremendous uh, uh, value and significance that our brothers and sisters in Gaza and Palestine have in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why, so you ask why we should teach about Palestine in schools and elsewhere? Well, I, I guess I can start off by saying what Edward Said said, because it's a just cause, it's a noble ideal, it's a moral quest for equality and human rights. But I could also add, because it's the land of Quds, Jerusalem, it is the land of Al-Aqsa, it is the land of the Isra and Mi'raj. It is the Qibla towards which Rasulullah sallallahu the Messenger of Allah, turned 17 months after Hijrah, after the migration. It is the land of many prophets and messengers. On the soils of Jerusalem, of Palestine, lived Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ishaq and Yaqub and Yusuf and Lut and Dawood and Sulaiman and Zakaria and Yahya and Isa alayhim salam. 
and many others whose names are not mentioned. It is the place of, uh, of the demise of the Dajjal. It is the place where Isa salam, will go and chase Dajjal and he would kill Dajjal. But it is also part of Asham, the Levant or the Great Assyria, as it is called, the land which Rasulullah prayed for when he said, Ya Allah, O oh Allah, bless, our, bless us in our Sham and in our Yemen. It is a land that is blessed. Uh, Palestine, because it is the land on which uh, many companions of Rasulullah many of the Sahaba stepped on it and th they died there. Abad ibn Samit, Shaddad ibn Aws, Usama bin Zayd bin Haritha, Wathil ibn al Asqa, Dahiyatul Kalbi, Aws ibn Samit, Mas'ud ibn Aws, and many, many other companions, the best of the best, were, went to Palestine. But it's also because it was the land of thousands of eminent scholars and ulama, both men and women, including Malik bin Dinar, Sufyan al Thawri, the prince of the scholars of Hadith, Ibn Shahab al Zuhri, and Al Shafi'i, rahmatullah alayhi, may Allah have rahman, all of them. Uh, but it is for the sake of Palestine also that the just Sultan Nur al Din al Zinji said, I'm ashamed before Allah to smile while Jerusalem is in captivity. And it is for the sake of Palestine that Sultan Abdul Hamid II sacrificed his throne in Khilafah and said, I cannot bear to sell even an inch of Palestine. So teaching about Palestine or Palestine in Islamic schools holds significant religious, historical, and socio-political importance within the Islamic community uh, largely due to the religious significance of the land that I have just outlined. Uh, it houses Al-Aqsa Masjid. It is the third holiest site in Islam, and so on. But this aspect of teaching about Islam involves various facets. When we teach about Islam, there is the religious significance. Religious connection, teaching about Islam, gives us and our students that religious connection, significant religious connection, Palestine and its surrounding are deeply embedded in Islamic history and tradition. We mentioned in the Quran and the Hadith, and therefore teaching about Palestine fosters a religious and a moral connection to the land and its religious significance, including historical figures and events as are mentioned. But also it's, it, it engenders solidarity and identity, as has been mentioned already. Learning about Palestine helps foster a sense of unity and solidarity among Muslims worldwide, reinforcing the concept of the Ummah. It emphasizes the importance of supporting fellow Muslims in need, which is a core principle in Islam. But also teaching about Islam religiously creates awareness and responsibility, educating our students and indeed ourselves about the historical and ongoing challenges faced by Palestinians, including uh, those related to sovereignty, rights, and access to holy sites, aim to instill a sense of responsibility and advocacy for justice and peace and mercy, uh, principles highly valued in Islam. So what are the consequences for not developing a curriculum that teaches about Palestine? Well, number one, lack of awareness. Without a structured curriculum, students may grow up, they will grow up lacking awareness uh, or having a limited understanding of the religious, historical, and political significance of Palestine to Islam and Muslims worldwide. It'll be a missed opportunity or a missed educational opportunity. Uh, schools may miss the opportunity to instill that critical or criticality that we heard about, or the empathy, a sense of justice and rahmah regarding global issues, not just the Palestinian issue, which are crucial components of Islamic education. And if we don't develop our own curriculum, then there we expose our students to potential bias and misinformation, as we have heard also. In the absence of a carefully developed curriculum, students and indeed ourselves will be exposed definitely to biased, incomplete or incorrect information from less reliable sources, leading to misconception about Palestine and its significance to Islam and to the world at large. And so we cannot afford not to uh, develop a curricula that uh, speaks about is, uh, Palestine from within our own Islamic worldview, from within our own ways of knowing and doing and being. 
we cannot afford to leave this very significant and pivotal issue that affects not only just the Ummah of Islam, but the entire world. We can't just leave that for uh, wishful thinking. We can't just leave it and think that by uh, simply being advocates and protesting and speaking up, but not developing the right curricula and investing in that, we are simply foregoing our responsibility and our mas'uliyah, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us about. And this is a very important point. So before even thinking about being accountable to our own students or our own teachers or our own community, we have to think about being accountable before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will say that you saw with your own eyes a genocide that was taking place. You saw injustices, you saw complete destruction and obliteration of a nation, of a culture, of a civilization, of peoples. And what did you do? Did you, uh, did you rely on your own curricula or others? And so the importance of well-researched educational resource uh, has several, uh, sev several components. Number one, it allows accuracy, accuracy and depth. Well-researched and vetted educational resources, and we have heard about some, ensure that the information provided is accurate, comprehensive, and reflective of the complexities surrounding Palestine. And this is critical for fostering a well-informed, empathetic, and pro proactive Muslim community. But also it's important because it allows us to counter misinformation. And in an era, as you know, of widespread misinformation, and reliable resources play a vital role in countering falsehood, in countering uh, biased narratives about Palestine, promoting a more balanced and a fair understanding the objective of, of Palestine. Otherwise, we will be repeating the same problematic narrative that was, uh, that was experienced by the, Afro the African Americans, by the Palestinians, by the indigenous communities. So this is our moment. This is our moment to take on the challenge and to create our own curricula. But also it's empowerment through education. Educated individuals are better equipped to engage in meaningful discussions and advocacy and efforts towards peace and justice. Knowledge, in fact, empowers our students. We must never fear knowledge. And we look at the Islamic civilization. I always say, they said to the world, bring it on, <laughs> bring it on. And then they filtered it through their own Islamic worldview, added to it, edited it, and then contributed major contributions. We should never be frightened of knowledge. Knowledge empowers students and it empowers our wider community and it, it allows us to make informed decisions. It allows our students to make informed decisions and constructive action, take constructive ac action. But also there is this global and historical context. Understanding the situation in Philistine with the broader historical and global context through uh, well-researched and vetted resources that we develop allows our learners to appreciate the significance of the land beyond the immediate conflict. It helps contextualize the religious, cultural, and political importance of Philistine throughout Islamic history, and not just now, right? And investing in a well-researched educational resource on Philistine is not only critical for making, for imparting knowledge, but also for nurturing a generation of informed, compassionate, and proactive Muslim communities that, uh, hope, that hope to uphold that justice and peace and spread that rahmah and become the healing for the world, uh, as we have heard from the various speakers. I'll stop here, but I thought these are just quick points to share. Jazakumullah khair. I know I'm supposed to finish with dua. I'll wait for your instruction for that, inshallah. Thank you so much, um, Professor Abdullah, for providing us with um, un an understanding of the importance of Palestine in so many different components and facets. It's really important for us to understand that there is a lot in common in terms of the oppressive forces occurring across the world and over time um, that we're witnessing right now in Palestine, as well as um, what something unique, very many unique aspects of Palestine as well. And um, at this time, I'd like to ask you to, without falling asleep, <laughs> take a minute to 
close your eyes and imagine with me. Imagine Gaza, we've seen Gaza right now. Many of you may have been to Gaza, but most of us have not. Imagine right now roads rebuilt, schools functional, hospitals in full operational mode, alhamdulillah, treating normal patients that come in on a daily basis in any society. Imagine a Palestine that has Muslims, Jews, and Christians working, living, laughing, collaborating side by side, peacefully thriving. Imagine with me Al-Quds led by a righteous Muslim leader, spreading light and love and peace and justice not just for the inhabitants of that state and political entity, but for the Ummah and for all of humanity. Imagine our Islamic schools teaching, having taught that leader. Imagine having taught the lawyers that fought for the justice that allowed for Palestine to be in this space. Imagine the doctors graduating from our Islamic schools, yours, your student, working in that space. Imagine our graduates working and teaching and leading here in the United States, working for justice, not just for Palestine, but for all living things. This is what we hope for and imagine to come about when we own and we create the educational resources that we are providing to our children. Right now, we start with the Palestine Education Toolkit. Inshallah, we'll hear more about it. The Teaching Palestine Toolkit, we'll hear more about it from Dr. Summer. But this isn't the end, as Professor Abdullah shared, as we've heard and learned from Sister um, Quran, from Dr. Khalifa, this requires us to do so much more for us to look internally as well, for our leaders to ask the hard questions, to collect the data, to be able to prove not anecdotally, but to learn actually what's happening in their schools and to learn what's needed to improve them so that we really genuinely are fulfilling the imana. I don't want to go in too much to um, my dear sister, Summer's presentation. I know she'll be speaking to us a bit more, but I want to remind you of this vision that we have for the Teaching Palestine Toolkit. And we want to invite you to be part of this because we're going to build it, inshallah. By Allah's will and mercy, we will build it. My question to you is, will you be a part of it? Thank you so much to those of you who have already contributed. Sisters um, uh, Quran and Sister Khansa have been posting the links here in the chat for how you can contribute. We invite those of you who have connections with other organizations who can help fund us in larger amounts to um, reach out to us and help us have this project fully funded so that we can expedite the, um, the outputs from this. So Sister Summer, um, Dr. Summer al Majede is going to be speaking with us a little bit more. Dr. Samar al Majede is the ISLA Research Project Manager who's led many key initiatives here at the ISLA in the past two years that she has been, two plus years that she's been with us, including the ISLA, ISLA Crisis Response Toolkit and now the Teaching Palestine Toolkit, as well as the database um, uh, project, which is a huge project. And I'm sorry that it, uh, it is there. I just didn't say it. Uh, Dr. Samar's expertise lies in Islamic sciences and organizational leadership particularly in Islamic schools. Beyond her work at, uh, with the ISLA, Dr. Summer is an educational consultant and certified evaluator involved in curriculum development and school accreditation reviews. She also holds a board position at a local relief foundation. Dr. Summer is from Gaza and um, more importantly, she, or, or very importantly, she is very committed to and passionate about this project and has the skills to help lead it. Dr. Summer, we're so, Happy and honored to have you at the ISLA and to really bring this project to life. Thank you so much. 
جزاكم الله خيرا دكتور شهزاد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله رمضان مبارك for everyone and I'm deeply uh, honored to be with you today and uh, deeply inspired by all the uh, speakers the esteemed speakers that went before uh, my my presentation and I will start with بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي uh, we, alhamdulillah, are uh, all heard about the problem, which is the misinformation, misrepresentation about the narrative on Palestine. So uh, at ISLA, we really uh, wanted to be part of the solution and impact change in our Islamic schools and beyond Islamic schools. And we are deeply inspired by the hadith, قَالَ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ رَأَى مِنْكُمْ مُنْكَرًا فَلْيُغَيِّرُهُ بِيَدِهِ فَإِنْ لَمْ يستطع فَبِلِسَانِهِ فَإِنْ لَمْ يستطع فبقلبه وهذا أضعف الإيمان uh, Whoever among you witnesses an act of an evil let him change it with his hand and if it, he are not able to do so so let him change it by his tongue and if he's unable to do so so let them or him um, change it uh, uh, in his heart and we believe we firmly believe that education is a form of changing evil um, so I'd like to uh, uh, begin my presentation by sharing a behind the scenes look at our thought process when developing the toolkit. Uh, the first one is like addressing the urgency. So for the past six months uh, or so, many of our students, ourselves first and students, teachers come to school every day, overwhelmed, feeling grief, frustrated and feeling helpless by the news they see live streamed every day about Gaza. The real talk here, how are we addressing that in our classroom, in our sc schools? Or are we addressing it at all? So at ISLA, we felt we can do more than, and not to discount th those acts of worship, more than sincere dua, and dua, of course, the weapon of the mu'min, silah al-mu'min, and we can do more than donations and protesting. We wanted to take an action beyond that by raising awareness and importance of teaching about Palestine in our classrooms today. To this end, we have been speaking with Islamic principals, leaders across the nation, and found that in most cases, Palestine is not part of the curriculum, either for lack reliable materials or and lacking qualified teachers. And, so, and by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tawfiq and will, and of course your support, we promise that, inshallah, our toolkit to address the both problems. And by support, yes, we need the financial support for sure. We're raising fund here. But the support that we're really hoping for is a full engagement from our uh, Islamic school uh, leaders and communities to... Um, help us understand the deficiencies in the curriculum and, and, and help us shape this toolkit. This is an idea that uh, we, we are hoping that will gain momentum, will gain uh, support that will, inshallah, go beyond that we are originally hoping for. Our mission is to provide educators with factual resources about Palestine and the, uh, to counter widespread misrepresentation and misinformation in mainstream media and textbooks as Sister Bahia enlightened us and other uh, speakers, they uh, uh, really uh, um, focus on the pro-Israeli education companies that are promoting curriculum and, and, and uh, conducting uh, PDS um, in, in uh, misleading, um, they are leading professional development in the Islamic, in the uh, um, public school system, and we all know that they are unbalanced and not objective. So fe from feeling sense of amana and responsibility, I feel that um, the entire world is inspired by, by, by Palestine, by Gaza, but by what's going on right now. And we're seeing lots of non-Muslims wanting to learn about 
the story of Palestine and Gaza and what make the Gaza people so special and so resilient and what is the faith, faith behind this. They are flocking to read the Quran and to learn more about Islam and uh, many of them entering Islam. So subhanAllah, we, we at, at, at ISLA and at the Islamic school, we are uniquely positioned to serve more than 300 Islamic schools, uh, which they serve more than 70,000 uh, uh, Muslim students. And our relationship goes beyond uh, USA. And we have relationships with uh, global mm. associations of Islamic schools. So we felt the great sense of amana and we know that we will we will be asked about the resources and the position and the impact we have in at isla and uh, at our islamic schools so the vision came uh, around uh, in simple words is to enrich islamic education by using Palestinian history and its significance in islam as a central case piece weaving in islamic core values like social justice perseverance and dignity to strengthen student faith, identity, and connection to the global ummah. So by exploring Palestine ongoing story, students can actively engage with core Islamic values like justice, perseverance, dignity, bravery, modesty, uh, that they, we see vividly lived in real life situations, making Islamic principles more tangible and meaningful, connecting past lessons of Sira and stories of Sahaba with present realities of Gaza. Lessons on martyrism, um, tawakkul, yaqeen, acceptance of Allah, decree, rida, uh, sacrifice, bravery, speaking truth to power. That's a form of jihad. That's the best or highest form of jihad. Modesty. We are seeing uh, everyday reports on uh, Gaza and we see the women there preserving their modesty in the midst of bombardments. They care so much about keeping and preserving their modesty. And this is those lessons should be brought into our classroom. What inspires the word and, 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 and caused uh, spiritual awakeness, like I, I like to uh, say, we have to bring it back to our Islamic schools and uh, our classrooms for sure. So this toolkit is not an informational dump. It's not just a collection of information. There is a, a thought process behind it, inshallah. And Palestine is just a starting point. It's a piece of a bigger puzzle. And we're not going to end there. We're planning more uh, educational toolkits uh, that touch on uh, different uh, nations and uh, countries that are fighting oppression and pursuing justice. And uh, I'd like to mention uh, Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King, uh, profound quote, and he said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The first time I read this quote, I was in tears because how beautiful and how uh, true this, um, uh, uh, this quote is. So I'm going to dive a little bit more uh, deeper to the components of the toolkit. And it's, uh, it, it consists of a curriculum guide and it's lesson plans covering key historic periods and events, guidelines for discussing sensitive topics and current events uh, in a trauma-informed uh, uh, manner, an age-appropriate uh, manner aligned with common core standards in the U.S. Also, we're planning to create an interactive map. Most of our kids and even us are becoming more visual learners, uh, thanks for the technology and the social media uh, made our span, uh, sh attention span is way shorter. So uh, we thought that interactive timeline uh, on Palestine history and ancient times and present, uh, highlighting key events and figures and turning points would be very uh, vital asset for our students. Uh, another component is a resource library. It's a curated collection of books, articles, and useful websites. Uh, another very important component is discussion and activity templates. We're planning to create templates for classroom discussions and hands-on projects and group activities. 
uh, along with multimedia repository, a collection of videos, documentaries, interviews, and virtual tours. And the a very unique, um, inshallah, uh, addition or part of the toolkit is a teacher training component. And we all know a good curriculum is only good if it's um, if it's not backed by a qualified teacher. Otherwise, it's just an, another item in the closet. So the training component is really crucial to bring the curriculum into life and familiarize the teachers and educators with the toolkit, toolkit components. Uh, the phases of the projects are four phases. Uh, we, we will start with gap analysis, because like uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed Khalifa mentioned that we need to learn about our schools, not other schools, not other communities. We need to learn about our schools. And, and, and one way to do so is by conducting uh, research, gap analysis, focus groups, and connecting with the end user. We don't want to uh, build a toolkit uh, resource for Islamic schools in isolation with the end user. We need to hear from all stakeholders board members, parents, teachers, uh, school leaders, most importantly, teachers and students. We want their input to shape this toolkit. Uh, we, we always have this dilemma between uh, practitioners and researchers and we researchers would like to uh, build our own world in isolation of uh, the practitioners. And in, at ISLA, we really believe uh, in the power of bridging the gap between these uh, two um, worlds. So the second um, uh, phase is curation of the resource itself. It's a, a process that will um, start actually in conjunction with the gap analysis and the understanding of the uh, realities of our Islamic schools. And that's a revision, a process of re revision and vetted um, by experts in the field of curriculum design and Middle East studies, inshallah. The third phase is building the toolkit itself. And it's gonna be a web page free um, uh, of accessible to all edu educators around the wo world. And it's free of charge. And it's gonna be hosted on ISLA's website, inshallah. Uh, also, the teacher uh, training component, it's going to uh, be uh, um, part, of, part of the project, and uh, we are aiming to conduct at least two webinars uh, and two uh, in-person sessions with pilot schools and um, educate and train at least 200 teachers around the country, inshallah. I really want you to support us for uh, multiple reasons, and you guys did a greater job in explaining the rationale behind supporting such a project. And I would like to conclude by saying the toolkit, inshallah, will serve a great need uh, and will fill a great gap. And it's uh, our promise is it's going to be deeply rooted in Islam. It's going to be relevant. It is data informed. It is backed by experts in the field and aligned with common core standards, it's user-friendly, and it has a training component. Jazakumullah khairan uh, for your time and for being with us today. We really deeply appreciate your presence uh, with us today. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Dr. Summer. So we'd like to call you to support us, inshallah. Uh, again, um, there's the donate, please. Um, we're also looking for five schools to pilot this with in which we'd be working with them to um, do a gap analysis, we'll really be able to understand the needs in your school and to be able to create the toolkit around that. Through those five schools, inshallah, we should have a good sense of what our schools across the Islam uh, Islamic school field need and to be able to create a relevant and useful toolkit, inshallah. We would provide teacher training to those schools and we're suggesting a $5,000 donation from those schools as a commitment um, to your ongoing engagement. You would be able to provide us with feedback at each stage of the toolkit and be able to really contribute to this um, resource that would be available to Islamic schools and individuals around the world, inshallah. 
Um, and we also invite you to provide strategic support to us, share with us funding leads, um, share material resources, inshallah, and provide expertise um, if you have it, inshallah. Please reach out to Dr. Summer um, if you're able to do that last one. So the last thing, honestly, is please don't forget to keep us in your du'as. And without taking any more time, I'd like to invite um, our beloved Professor Abdullah to lead us in a concluding du'a, inshallah, just before we leave. Um, and want to thank you all so much for being here. Please do um, participate in the du'a with us. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Abdullah. Yeah, Jazakallah khair. So I'll, I'll say the du'a in Arabic and do give some translation also in the du'a, inshallah. Uh, this du'a that I am going to make, uh, according to many, many ulama, is probably the most comprehensive du'a that a Muslim can make. And it is uh, considered of the jawami al-kalim, or the du'a uh, du that is has com a comprehensiveness of speech or economy of speech, where uh, through this du'a we're asking Allah Ta'ala for the best of this world and the next world. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم ربنا لك الحمد والشكر كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك اللهم إنا نعوذ بك منك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك اللهم صلي وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم إنا نسألك من الخير كله عاجله وأجله ما علمنا منه وما لم نعلم ونعوذ بك من الشر كله عاجله وأجله ما علمنا منه وما لم نعلم اللهم إنا نسألك الجنة وما قرب إليها من قول أو عمل ونعوذ بك من النار وما قرب إليها من قول أو عمل اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك منه عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما سألك منه عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم Ya Allah, we ask you for all the good, immediate, and future, what we know of it and what we do not know. And we seek refuge in you from all evil, immediate, and future, what we know of it and what we do not know. Ya Allah, we ask, we ask you for the best of what your servant and Prophet Muhammad وسلم, asked of you. And we seek refuge in you from the evil from which your servant and Prophet Muhammad وسلم, sought refuge from. Ya Allah, we ask for your Jannah and what brings us closer to it or, uh, through words, deeds, and intentions. And we seek refuge in, in you, Ya Allah, from the fire and what brings us closer to it of words and deeds. And we ask you, Ya Allah, to make every qadr, every decree, uh, a good decree, a good qadr for us, Ya Rahman Rahimeen. Allahumma inna ka'afu wa tuhibu al-afu fa'afu anna. Allahumma inna ka'afu wa tuhibu al-afu fa'afu anna. Ya Allah, you part, you're, you're the pardoner and you love to pardon, so pardon us, Ya Arhamar Rahimin. Allahumma Rabbana unsur ikhwanana fi Gaza wa fi Palestine. Allahumma kun lahum wa la takun alayhim. Allahumma at'imhum wa asqihim wa awihim. Ya Allah, help our brothers and sisters in Gaza and in Palestine and in all the parts, parts of the world where they are uh, oppressed and suffering including in Sudan and in Yemen and in other parts of the world, Ya Arham al-Rahimeen. Allahumma at'imhum, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, our brothers and sisters in Gaza are starving. So feed them, Ya Allah, for you are the best provider. And they are thirsty, Ya Allah, so give them a drink, Ya Allah, give them water, for you are the best sustainer. And they are without shelter, Ya Allah, fa'awihim, so give them shelter, Ya Arham al-Rahimeen. Allahumma kun lahum wa la takun alayhim. Ya Allah, be with them and for them and don't be against them, Ya Arham al-Rahimeen. And grant them victory and triumph, Ya Allah, in this dunya and in akhirah. Ya Allah, also uh, bestow your barakah and blessings on this noble project that is being undertaken to develop resources and curricula for the teaching of Phil about Pil Palestine, Ya Arham al-Rahimeen. And reward all those people, brothers and sisters who have Uh, started, initiated the idea, uh, those who are working to develop the idea, those who have participated today, Ya Allah, and everybody else who have contributed and participated either through time or money or intellect or uh, any other means, Ya Arham al-Rahimeen. Wa salli Allahumma wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma asifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ameen, ameen. 
Thank you so much, uh, Professor Abdullah. Jazakum al khairan to all of our beloved brothers and sisters who've joined us here today. Um, thank you to, uh, may Allah accept from all of us, inshallah, um, for our intention to be part of the solution. And um, may Allah grant us tawfiq. May Allah grant izza to uh, the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to allow us to be part of it, inshallah, to continue to use us and not replace us. Let us continue to rely on each other for support, inshallah. Um, and if we can get a, it's it's silly. If we can get a picture of us together, if anyone is ready for, um, sisters, if you're ready to get a screenshot picture here, I see Brother Yahya joining us from Saudi. Um, mashallah, it's a beautiful group here. Um, Jazakallah khair, Dr. Goldie. Yes, ma mashallah. And I am so honored that you all stayed on, mashallah. I know some people weren't able to stay, but it's just so beautiful that we have the, the, the qualities that we have in our deen of humility. And we have such busy individuals here and each of you, and that you joined us today is just such an honor. Jazakallah khair, may Allah make us worthy, inshallah. Where are the rest of you? 58 people, come on. Mashallah, Dr. Sharif al Makki, Mashallah, Sister Jabin, Dr. Layla Shatara, Mashallah. Who are these giants with us? Mashallah, don't be shy. All right, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You have three seconds, and I'm going for the for the picture here. Come on, we need three more people with Dr. Layla. Dr. Layla's on the bottom of. She's the base. Mashallah, Dr. Layla, you're the base here. Where's Dr. Sima? All right, smile. <laughs> Jazakallah khair. Free Palestine, inshallah, may Allah allow us to continue to work for his cause. Ameen. And please forgive us for our shortcomings. Forgive me for my shortcomings. I apologize. There was a little confusion there with the time as well. We got Sister Jabin here, mashallah. Um, thank you all so much. And please stay in touch, stay connected. And um, we look forward to learning from you and with you and insha inshallah being of service to you. Uh, may Allah continue to alleviate the suffering around the world in our hearts and our homes in our communities, in our country, and around the world with our brothers and sisters in Gaza, Sudan, Yemen, Fikuli Makan. Jazakum Allah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Thank you, Dr. Sharif, for joining. I'm embarrassed. I, we would love to hear from you. I'm embarrassed that we didn't you know, hear from you in, in your presence here. Mashallah, he's been chatting in the chat. Another scholar with us. Dr. Ahmad, jazakallah khair for being here.